1. Evolution, the themes of biology, and scientific inquiry. Figure 1.1 The light, 
dappled color of this beach mouse, Peromiscus polionotus, allows it to blend blend into its habitat brilliant white sand dunes dotted with sparse clumps of beach grass along the Florida seashore. Mice of the same species that inhabit nearby inland areas are much darker, blending with the soil and vegetation where they live. 1.1 to 1 full alternative text. Key concepts. 1.1 the study of life reveals unifying themes. 3. 1.2 the core theme, evolution accounts for the unity and diversity of life of 11. 1.3 In studying nature, scientists form and test hypothesis. 16. 1.4 Science benefits from a cooperative approach and diverse viewpoints. 22. Study tip. Make a table, list the five unifying themes of biology across the top. Enter at least three examples of each theme as you read this chapter. One example is filled in for you. To help you focus on these big ideas, Continue adding examples throughout your study of biology. Go to Mastering Biology. For students, in e-text and study area. Get ready for Chapter 1 Figure 1.8 Walkthrough, Gene Expression, Cells use information encoded in a gene to synthesize a functional protein. Video, Galapagos Biodiversity by Peter and Rosemary Grant. For instructors to assign, in item library. Scientific skills exercise, interpreting a pair of bar graphs. Tutorial, the scientific method. Concept 1.1 The study of life reveals unifying themes. At the most fundamental level, we may ask, what is life? Even a child realizes that a dog or a plant is alive, while a rock or a car is not. Yet the phenomenon we call life defies a simple definition. We recognize life by what living things do. Figure 1.2 highlights some of the properties and processes we associate with life. Figure 1.2 Some properties of life. Figure 1.2 Full alternative text. Mastering biology. Animation, Signs of Life Video, See Horse Camouflage Biology, the scientific study of life, is a subject of enormous scope, and exciting new biological discoveries are being made every day. How can you organize into a comprehensible framework all the information you'll encounter as you study biology? Focusing on a few big ideas will help. Here are five unifying themes ways of thinking about life that will still be useful decades from now. Organization Information Energy and matter Interactions Evolution In this section and the next, we'll briefly explore each theme. Theme, new properties emerge at successive levels of biological organization. Organization The study of life on Earth extends from the microscopic scale of the molecules and cells that make up organisms to the global scale of the entire living planet. As biologists, we can divide this enormous range into different levels of biological organization. In Figure 1.3, we zoom in from space to take a closer and closer look at life in a mountain meadow. This journey, depicted as a series of numbered steps, highlights the hierarchy of biological organization. Figure 1.3 Exploring Levels of Biological Organization 1.1 to 3 Full Alternative Text Zooming in at ever finer resolution illustrates the principle that underlies reductionism, an approach that reduces complex systems to simpler components that are more manageable to study. Reductionism is a powerful strategy in biology. For example, by studying the molecular structure of DNA that had been extracted from cells, James Watson and Francis Crick inferred the chemical basis of biological inheritance. Despite its importance, reductionism provides an incomplete view of life on Earth, as you'll see next. Emergent Properties Let's re-examine. Figure 1.3, beginning this time at the molecular level and then zooming out. This approach allows us to see novel properties emerge at each level that are absent from the preceding one. These emergent properties are due to the arrangement and interactions of parts as complexity increases. For example, although photosynthesis occurs in an intact chloroplast, it will not take place if chlorophyll and other chloroplast molecules are simply mixed in a test tube. 
the coordinated processes of photosynthesis require a specific organization of these molecules in the chloroplast. Isolated components of living systems The objects of study in a reductionist approach lack a number of significant properties that emerge at higher levels of organization. Emergent properties are not unique to life. A box of bicycle parts won't transport you anywhere, but if they are arranged in a certain way, you can pedal to your chosen destination. Compared with such non-living examples, however, biological systems are far more complex, making the emergent properties of life especially challenging to study. To fully explore emergent properties, biologists today complement reductionism with Systems Biology, the exploration of a biological system by analyzing the interactions among its parts. In this context, a single leaf cell can be considered a system, as can a frog, an ant colony, or a desert ecosystem. By examining and modeling the dynamic behavior of an integrated network of components, systems biology enables us to pose new kinds of questions. For example, how do networks of molecular interactions in our bodies generate our 24-hour cycle of wakefulness and sleep? At a larger scale, how does a gradual increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide alter ecosystems and the entire biosphere? Systems biology can be used to study life at all levels. Structure and function At each level of the biological hierarchy, we find a correlation between structure and function. Consider the leaf in Figure 1.3, it's broad, flat shape maximizes the capture of sunlight by chloroplasts. Because such correlations of structure and function are common in all living things, analyzing a biological structure gives us clues about what it does and how it works. For example, the hummingbird's anatomy allows its wings to rotate at the shoulder, so hummingbirds have the ability, unique among birds, to fly backward or hover in place. While hovering, the birds can extend their long, slender beaks into flowers and feed on nectar. The elegant match of form and function in the structures of life is explained by natural selection, which we'll explore shortly. The cell, an organism's basic unit of structure and function. The cell is the smallest unit of organization that can perform all activities required for life. The so-called cell theory was first developed in the 1800s, based on the observations of many scientists. The theory states that all living organisms are made of cells, which are the basic unit of life. In fact, the actions of organisms are all based on the activities of cells. For instance, the movement of your eyes as you read the sentence results from the activities of muscle and nerve cells. Even a process that occurs on a global scale, such as the recycling of carbon atoms, is the product of cellular functions, including the photosynthetic activity of chloroplasts in leaf cells. All cells share certain characteristics. For instance, every cell is enclosed by a membrane that regulates the passage of materials between the cell and its surroundings. Nevertheless, we distinguish two main forms of cells, prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Prokaryotic cells are found in two groups of single celled microorganisms, bacteria, singular, bacterium, and archaea, singular, archaean. All other forms of life, including plants and animals, are composed of eukaryotic cells. A. Eukaryotic cell contains membrane enclosed organelles. Figure 1.4. Some organelles, such as the DNA containing nucleus, are found in the cells of all eukaryotes, other organelles are specific to particular cell types. For example, the chloroplast in. Figure 1.3 is an organelle found only in eukaryotic cells that carry out photosynthesis. In contrast to eukaryotic cells, a prokaryotic cell lacks a nucleus or other membrane-enclosed organelles. Furthermore, prokaryotic cells are generally smaller than eukaryotic cells, as shown in Figure 1.4. Figure 1.4 contrasting eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells in size and complexity. The cells are shown to scale here, to see a larger magnification of a prokaryotic cell, see. Figure 6.5 Figure 1.4 Full alternative text Visual skills measure the scale bar, the length of the prokaryotic cell, and the diameter of the eukaryotic cell. Knowing that this scale bar represents 1 mu m, Calculate the length of the prokaryotic cell and the diameter of the eukaryotic cell in μm. Theme, life's processes involve the expression and transmission of genetic information. Information within cells, structures called chromosomes contain genetic material in the form of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. In cells that are preparing to divide, the chromosomes may be made visible using a dye that appears blue when bound to the DNA. Figure 1.5 Figure 1.5 A lung cell from a newt divides into two smaller cells that will grow and divide again. DNA, the genetic material. 
Each chromosome contains one very long DNA molecule with hundreds or thousands of genes, each a section of the DNA of the chromosome. Transmitted from parents to offspring, genes are the units of inheritance. They encode the information necessary to build all of the molecules synthesized within a cell, which in turn establish that cell's identity and function. You began as a single cell stocked with DNA inherited from your parents. The replication of that DNA prior to each cell division transmitted copies of the DNA to what eventually became the trillions of cells of your body. As the cells grew and divided, the genetic information encoded by the DNA directed your development. Figure 1.6 Figure 1.6 Inherited DNA directs the development of an organism. The molecular structure of DNA accounts for its ability to store information. A DNA molecule is made up of two long chains, called strands, arranged in a double helix. Each chain is made up of four kinds of chemical building blocks called nucleotides, abbreviated A, T, C, and G. Figure 1.7 Specific sequences of these four nucleotides encode the information in genes. The way DNA encodes information is analogous to how we arrange the letters of the alphabet into words and phrases with specific meanings. The word rat, for example, evokes a rodent, the words tar and art, which contain the same letters, mean very different things. We can think of nucleotides as a four-letter alphabet. Figure 1.7 DNA, the genetic material. Figure 1.7 Full Alternative Text. Mastering Biology. Animation. Heritable information, DNA. For many genes, the sequence provides the blueprint for making a protein. For instance, a given bacterial gene may specify a particular protein, such as an enzyme, required to break down a certain sugar molecule, while one particular human gene may denote an enzyme, and another gene a different protein, an antibody, perhaps, that helps fight off infection. Overall, proteins are major players in building and maintaining the cell and carrying out its activities. Protein encoding genes control protein production indirectly, using a related molecule called RNA as an intermediary. The sequence of nucleotides along a gene is transcribed into mRNA, which is then translated into a linked series of protein building blocks called amino acids. Once completed, the amino acid chain forms a specific protein with a unique shape and function. The entire process by which the information in a gene directs the manufacture of a cellular product is called Gene Expression Figure 1.8 Figure 1.8 Gene Expression, cells use information encoded in a gene to synthesize a functional protein. Figure 1.8 Full Alternative Text Mastering Biology Figure Walkthrough In carrying out gene expression, all forms of life employ essentially the same genetic code, a particular sequence of nucleotides means the same thing in one organism as it does in another. Differences between organisms reflect differences between their nucleotide sequences rather than between their genetic codes. This universality of the genetic code is a strong piece of evidence that all life is related. Comparing the sequences in several species for a gene that codes for a particular protein can provide valuable information both about the protein and about the relationship of the species to each other. Molecules of mRNA, like the one in Figure 1.8, are translated into proteins, but other cellular RNAs function differently. For example, we have known for decades that some types of RNA are actually components of the cellular machinery that manufactures proteins. In the last few decades, scientists have discovered new classes of RNA that play other roles in the cell, such as regulating the function of protein coding genes. Genes specify these RNAs as well, and their production is also referred to as gene expression. By carrying the instructions for making proteins and RNAs and by replicating with each cell division, DNA ensures faithful inheritance of genetic information from generation to generation. Genomics, large-scale analysis of DNA sequences. The entire library of genetic instructions that an organism inherits is called its genome. A typical human cell has two similar sets of chromosomes, and each set has approximately 3 billion nucleotide pairs of DNA. If the one-letter abbreviations for the nucleotides of a set were written in letters the size of those you are now reading, the genomic text would fill about 700 biology textbooks. Since the early 1990s, the pace at which researchers can determine the sequence of a genome has accelerated at an astounding rate, enabled by a revolution in technology. The genome sequence the entire sequence of nucleotides for a representative member of a species is now known for humans and many other animals, as well as numerous plants, fungi, bacteria, and archaea. To make sense of the deluge of data from genome sequencing projects and the growing catalog of known gene functions, scientists are applying a systems biology approach at the cellular and molecular levels. Rather than investigating a single gene at a time, 
researchers study whole sets of genes, or other DNA, in one or more species an approach called genomics. Likewise, the term proteomics refers to the study of sets of proteins and their properties. The entire set of proteins expressed by a given cell, tissue, or organism is called a proteome. Three important research developments have made the genomic and proteomic approaches possible. One is high-throughput technology, tools that can analyze many biological samples very rapidly. The second major development is bioinformatics, the use of computational tools to store, organize, and analyze the huge volume of data that results from high-throughput methods. The third development is the formation of interdisciplinary research teams groups of diverse specialists that may include computer scientists, mathematicians, engineers, chemists, physicists, and, of course, biologists from a variety of fields. Researchers in such teams aim to learn how the activities of all the proteins and RNAs encoded by the DNA are coordinated in cells and in whole organisms. Theme, life requires the transfer and transformation of energy and matter. Energy and matter moving, growing, reproducing, and the various cellular activities of life are work, and work requires energy. The input of energy, primarily from the sun, and the transformation of energy from one form to another make life possible. Figure 1.9 when a plant's leaves absorb sunlight in the process of photosynthesis, molecules within the leaves convert the energy of sunlight to the chemical energy of food, such as sugars. The chemical energy in the food molecules is then passed along from plants and other photosynthetic organisms. Producers, to consumers. A. Consumer is an organism that feeds on other organisms or their remains. Figure 1.9 Energy Flow and Chemical Cycling There is a one-way flow of energy in an ecosystem, during photosynthesis, plants convert energy from sunlight to chemical energy, stored in food molecules such as sugars, which is used by plants and other organisms to do work and is eventually lost from the ecosystem as heat. In contrast, chemical cycle between organisms and the physical environment. Figure 1.9 Full Alternative Text When an organism uses chemical energy to perform work, such as muscle contraction or cell division, some of that energy is lost to the surroundings as heat. As a result, energy flows through an ecosystem in one direction, usually entering as light and exiting as heat. In contrast, chemical cycle within an ecosystem, where they are used and then recycled, see. Figure 1.9. Chemicals that a plant absorbs from the air or soil may be incorporated into the plant's body and then passed to an animal that eats the plant. Eventually, these chemicals will be returned to the environment by decomposers such as bacteria and fungi that break down waste products, leaf litter, and the bodies of dead organisms. The chemicals are then available to be taken up by plants again, thereby completing the cycle. Theme, from molecules to ecosystems, interactions are important in biological systems. Interactions at any level of the biological hierarchy, interactions between the components of the system ensure smooth integration of all the parts, such that they function as a whole. This holds true equally well for molecules in a cell and the components of an ecosystem, we'll look at both as examples. Molecules interactions within organisms. At lower levels of organization, the interactions between components that make up living organisms' organs, tissues, cells, and molecules are crucial to their smooth operation. Consider the regulation of blood sugar level, for instance. Cells in the body must match the supply of fuel, sugar, to demand, regulating the opposing processes of sugar breakdown and storage. The key is the ability of many biological processes to self-regulate by a mechanism called feedback. In Feedback regulation, the output, or product of a process regulates that very process. The most common form of regulation in living systems is negative feedback, a loop in which the response reduces the initial stimulus. As seen in the example of insulin signaling. Figure 1.10, after a meal the level of the sugar glucose in your blood rises, which stimulates cells of the pancreas to secrete insulin. Insulin, in turn, causes body cells to take up glucose and liver cells to store it, thus decreasing the blood glucose level. This eliminates the stimulus for insulin secretion, shutting off the pathway. Thus, the output of the process, insulin, negatively regulates that process. Figure 1.10 Feedback Regulation The human body regulates the use and storage of glucose, a major cellular fuel. This figure shows negative feedback, the response to insulin reduces the initial stimulus. Figure 1.10 Full Alternative Text Visual skills in this example what is the response to insulin? What is the initial stimulus that is reduced by the response? 
Though less common than processes regulated by negative feedback, there are also many biological processes regulated by positive feedback, in which an end product speeds up its own production. The clotting of your blood in response to injury is an example. When a blood vessel is damaged, structures in the blood called platelets begin to aggregate at the site. Positive feedback occurs as chemicals released by the platelets attract more platelets. The platelet pileup then initiates a complex process that seals the wound with a clot. Ecosystems, an organism's interactions with other organisms and the physical environment. At the ecosystem level, every organism interacts with other organisms. For instance, an acacia tree interacts with soil microorganisms associated with its roots, insects that live on it, and animals that eat its leaves and fruit. Figure 1.11 Interactions between organisms include those that are mutually beneficial, as when cleaner fish eat small parasites on a turtle, and those in which one species benefits and the other is harmed, as when a lion kills and eats a zebra. In some interactions between species, both are harmed for example, when two plants compete for a soil resource that is in short supply. Interactions among organisms help regulate the functioning of the ecosystem as a whole. Figure 1.11 Interactions of an African acacia tree with other organisms and the physical environment. Figure 1.11 Full Alternative Text Each organism also interacts continuously with physical factors in its environment. The leaves of a tree, for example, absorb light from the sun, take in carbon dioxide from the air, and release oxygen to the air, see. Figure 1.11 The environment is also affected by organisms. For instance, in addition to taking up water and minerals from the soil, the roots of a plant break up rocks as they grow, contributing to the formation of soil. On a global scale, plants and other photosynthetic organisms have generated all the oxygen in the atmosphere. Like other organisms, we humans interact with our environment. Our interactions sometimes have dire consequences, for example, over the past 150 years, humans have greatly increased the burning of fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas. This practice releases large amounts of carbon dioxide, CO2, and other gases into the atmosphere, causing heat to be trapped close to Earth's surface, see. Figure 56.29 Scientists calculate that the CO2 added to the atmosphere by human activities has increased the average temperature of the planet by about 1 degree Celsius since 1900. At the current rates that CO2 and other gases are being added to the atmosphere, global models predict an additional rise of at least 3 degrees Celsius before the end of the century. This ongoing global warming is a major aspect of Climate change, a directional change to the global climate that lasts for three decades or more, as opposed to short-term changes in the weather. But global warming is not the only way the climate is changing, wind and precipitation patterns are also shifting, and extreme weather events such as storms and droughts are occurring more often. Climate change has already affected organisms and their habitats all over the planet. For example, polar bears have lost much of the ice platform from which they hunt, leading to food shortages and increased mortality rates. As habitats deteriorate, hundreds of plant and animal species are shifting their ranges to more suitable locations but for some, there is insufficient suitable habitat, or they may not be able to migrate quickly enough. As a result, the populations of many species are shrinking in size or even disappearing. Figure 1.12 For more examples of how climate change is affecting life on Earth, see Make Connections. Figure 56.30 Figure 1.12 Threatened by Global Warming A warmer environment causes lizards in the genus Siloporus to spend more time in refuges from the heat, reducing time for foraging. Their food intake drops, decreasing reproductive success. Surveys of 200 siloporous populations in Mexico show that 12% of these populations have disappeared since 1975. The loss of populations due to climate change can ultimately result in extinction, the permanent loss of a species. As we'll explore in greater detail in Concept 56.4, the consequences of these changes for humans and other organisms may be profound. Having considered four of the unifying themes, organization, information, energy, and matter, and interactions, let's now turn to evolution. There is consensus among biologists that evolution is the core theme of biology, and it is discussed in detail in the next section. Concept Check 1.1 Starting with the molecular level in Figure 1.3, write a sentence that includes components from the previous, lower, level of biological organization, for example, a molecule consists of atoms bonded together. Continue with organelles, moving up the biological hierarchy. Identify the theme or themes exemplified by a. The sharp quills of a porcupine, b. The development of a multicellular organism from a single fertilized egg, and c. 
a hummingbird using sugar to power its flight. What if, for each theme, the Concept 1.2 The core theme, evolution accounts for the unity and diversity of life. Evolution and understanding of evolution helps us to make sense of everything we know about life on Earth. As the fossil record clearly shows, life has been evolving for billions of years, resulting in a vast diversity of past and present organisms. But along with the diversity there is also unity, in the form of shared features. For example, while seahorses, jackrabbits, hummingbirds, and giraffes all look very different, their skeletons are organized in the same basic way. The scientific explanation for the unity and diversity of organisms is Evolution, a process of biological change in which species accumulate differences from their ancestors as they adapt to different environments over time. Thus, we can account for differences between two species, diversity, with the idea that certain heritable changes occurred after the two species diverged from their common ancestor. However, they also share certain traits, unity, simply because they have descended from a common ancestor. An abundance of evidence of different types supports the occurrence of evolution and the mechanisms that describe how it takes place, which we'll explore in detail in Chapters 22 25 To quote one of the founders of modern evolutionary theory, Theodosius Dobbs Hansky, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. To understand this statement, we need to examine how biologists think about the vast diversity of life on the planet. Classifying the diversity of life Diversity is a hallmark of life. Biologists have so far identified and named about 1.8 million species of organisms. Each species is given a two-part name, the first part is the name of the genus, plural, genera, to which the species belongs, and the second part is unique to the species within the genus. For example, Homo sapiens is the name of our species. To date, known species include at least 100,000 species of fungi, 290,000 plant species, 57,000 vertebrate species, animals with backbones, and 1 million insect species, more than half of all known forms of life, not to mention the myriad types of single cellet organisms. Researchers identify thousands of additional species each year. Estimates of the total number of species range from about 10 million to over 100 million. Whatever the actual number, the enormous variety of life gives biology a very broad scope. Biologists face a major challenge in attempting to make sense of this variety. The three domains of life. Humans tend to group diverse items according to their similarities and relationships to each other. Consequently, biologists have long used careful comparisons of structure, function, and other obvious features to classify forms of life into groups. In the last few decades, new methods of assessing species relationships, such as comparisons of DNA sequences, have led to a re-evaluation of the classification of life. Although this re-evaluation is ongoing, biologists currently place all organisms into three groups called domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Figure 1.13 Figure 1.13 The Three Domains of Life Figure 1.13 Full Alternative Text Two of the Three Domains Bacteria and Archaea consist of single celled prokaryotic organisms. All the eukaryotes, organisms with eukaryotic cells, are in domain. Eukarya This domain includes four subgroups, Kingdom Plantae, Kingdom Fungi, Kingdom Animalia, and the Protists. The three kingdoms are distinguished partly by their modes of nutrition, plants produce their own sugars and other food molecules by photosynthesis, fungi absorb nutrients in dissolved form from their surroundings, and animals obtain food by eating and digesting other organisms. Animalia is, of course, the kingdom to which we belong. The most numerous and diverse eukaryotes are the Protists, which are mostly single cellate organisms. Although Protists were once placed in a single kingdom, they are now classified into several groups. One major reason for this change is the recent DNA evidence showing that some protists are less closely related to other protists than they are to plants, animals, or fungi. Unity in the diversity of life As diverse as life is, there is also remarkable unity among forms of life. Consider, for example, the similar skeletons of different animals and the universal genetic language of DNA, the genetic code, both mentioned earlier. In fact, Similarities between organisms are evident at all levels of the biological hierarchy. For example, unity is obvious in many features of cell structure, even among distantly related organisms. Figure 1.14 Figure 1.14 An example of unity underlying the diversity of life, the architecture of cilia in eukaryotes. Cilia, singular, cilium, are extensions of cells that function in locomotion. 
they occur in eukaryotes as diverse as paramecium, found in pond water, and humans. Even organisms so different share a common architecture for their cilia, which have an elaborate system of tubules that is striking in cross-sectional views. Figure 1.14 Full Alternative Text How can we account for life's dual nature of unity and diversity? The process of evolution, explained next, illuminates both the similarities and differences in the world of life. It also introduces another important dimension of biology, the passage of time. The history of life, as documented by fossils and other evidence, is the saga of an ever-changing earth billions of years old, inhabited by an evolving cast of living forms. Figure 1.15 Figure 1.15 Studying the History of Life Researchers in South Africa reconstruct skeletons of Homo naledi, an extinct relative of Homo sapiens. The fossils were discovered in an underground cave that may have been a burial chamber. Charles Darwin and the Theory of Natural Selection An evolutionary view of life came into sharp focus in November 1859, when Charles Darwin published one of the most important and influential books ever written, On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. Figure 1.16 The origin of species articulated two main points. The first point was that, as species adapt to different environments over time, they accumulate differences from their ancestors. Darwin called this process descent with modification. This insightful phrase captured the duality of life's unity and diversity unity in the kinship among species that descended from common ancestors and diversity in the modifications that evolved as species branched from their common ancestors. Figure 1.17 Darwin's second main point was his proposal that natural selection is a primary cause of descent with modification. Figure 1.16 Charles Darwin the portrait shows Darwin in about 1840, well before the 1859 publication of his revolutionary book, commonly referred to as The Origin of Species. Figure 1.17 Unity and Diversity Among Birds These four birds are variations on a common body plan. For example, each has feathers, a beak, and wings. However, these common features are highly specialized for the birds' diverse lifestyles. Figure 1.17 Full Alternative Text Darwin developed his theory of natural selection from observations that by themselves were neither new nor profound. However, although others had described the pieces of the puzzle, it was Darwin who saw how they fit together. He started with the following three observations from nature, first, individuals in a population vary in their traits, many of which seem to be heritable, passed on from parents to offspring. Second, a population can produce far more offspring than can survive to produce offspring of their own. With more individuals than the environment is able to support, Competition is inevitable. Third, species generally are suited to their environments in other words, they are adapted to their circumstances. For instance, a common adaptation among birds that eat hard seeds is an especially strong beak. By making inferences from these three observations, Darwin developed a scientific explanation for how evolution occurs. He reasoned that individuals with inherited traits that are better suited to the local environment are more likely to survive and reproduce than less well-suited individuals. Over many generations, a higher and higher proportion of individuals in a population will have the advantageous traits. Evolution occurs as the unequal reproductive success of individuals ultimately leads to adaptation to their environment, as long as the environment remains the same. Darwin called this mechanism of evolutionary adaptation. Natural selection because the natural environment consistently selects for the propagation of certain traits among naturally occurring variant traits in the population. The example in Figure 1.18 illustrates the ability of natural selection to edit an insect population's heritable variations in coloration. We see the products of natural selection in the exquisite adaptations of various organisms to the special circumstances of their way of life and their environment. The wings of the bat shown in. Figure 1.19 are an excellent example of adaptation. Figure 1.18 Natural Selection This imaginary beetle population has colonized a locale where the soil has been blackened by a recent brush fire. Initially, the population varies extensively in the inherited coloration of the individuals, from very light gray to charcoal. For hungry birds that prey on the beetles, it is easiest to spot the beetles that are lightest in color. Figure 1.18 Full Alternative Text Draw IT over time, the soil will gradually become lighter in color. Draw another step to show how the soil, when lightened to medium color, would affect natural selection. Write a caption for this new step 5. Then explain how the population would change over time as the soil becomes lighter. Mastering Biology HHMI Video, The Making of the Fittest, Natural Selection and Adaptation, Rock Pocket Mouse, 
HHMI. Figure 1.19 Evolutionary Adaptation Bats, the only mammals capable of active flight, have wings with webbing between extended fingers. Darwin proposed that such adaptations are refined over time by natural selection. The Tree of Life Take another look at the skeletal architecture of the bat's wings in Figure 1.19 These wings are not like those of feathered birds, the bat is a mammal. The bones, joints, nerves, and blood vessels in the bat's forelimbs, though adapted for flight, are very similar to those in the human arm, the foreleg of a horse, and the flipper of a whale. Indeed, all mammalian forelimbs are anatomical variations of a common architecture. According to the Darwinian concept of descent with modification, the shared anatomy of mammalian limbs reflects inheritance of the limb structure from a common ancestor the prototype mammal from which all other mammals descended. The diversity of mammalian forelimbs results from modification by natural selection operating over millions of years in different environmental contexts. Fossils and other evidence corroborate anatomical unity in supporting this view of mammalian descent from a common ancestor. Darwin proposed that natural selection, by its cumulative effects over long periods of time, could cause an ancestral species to give rise to two or more descendant species. This could occur, for example, if one population of organisms became fragmented into several subpopulations isolated in different environments. In these separate arenas of natural selection, one species could gradually radiate into multiple species as the geographically isolated populations adapted over many generations to different environmental conditions. The Galapagos finches are a famous example of the process of radiation of new species from a common ancestor. Darwin collected specimens of these birds during his 1835 visit to the remote Galapagos Islands, 900 kilometers km off the Pacific coast of South America. These relatively young volcanic islands are home to many species of plants and animals found nowhere else in the world, though many Galapagos organisms are clearly related to species on the South American mainland. The Galapagos finches are thought to have descended from an ancestral finch species that reached the archipelago from South America or the Caribbean. Over time, the Galapagos finches diversified from their ancestor as populations became adapted to different food sources on their particular islands. Years after Darwin collected the finches, researchers began to sort out their evolutionary relationships, first from anatomical and geographic data and more recently with the help of DNA sequence comparisons. Mastering Biology Video, Galapagos Biodiversity by Peter and Rosemary Grant Biologists' diagrams of evolutionary relationships generally take tree-like forms, though the trees are often turned sideways as in. Figure 1.20 Tree diagrams make sense, just as an individual has a genealogy that can be diagrammed as a family tree, each species is one twig of a branching tree of life extending back in time through ancestral species more and more remote. Species that are very similar, such as the Galapagos finches, share a relatively recent common ancestor. Through an ancestor that lived much further back in time, finches are related to sparrows, hawks, penguins, and all other birds. Furthermore, finches and other birds are related to us through a common ancestor even more ancient. Trace life back far enough, and we reach the early prokaryotes that inhabited Earth over 3.5 billion years ago. We can recognize their vestiges in our own cells in the universal genetic code, for example. Indeed, all of life is connected through its long evolutionary history. Figure 1.20 Descent with Modification, Adaptive Radiation of Finches on the Galapagos Islands This tree illustrates a current hypothesis for the evolutionary relationships of finches on the Galapagos. Note the various beaks, which are adapted to particular food sources. For example, heavier, thicker beaks are better at cracking seeds, while the more slender beaks are better at grasping insects. Figure 1.20 Full Alternative Text Mastering Biology HHMI Video, The Origin of Species, The Beak of the Finch HHMI Concept Check 1.2 Concept 1.3 In Studying Nature, Scientists Form, and Test Hypotheses Science is a way of knowing an approach to understanding the natural world. It developed out of our curiosity about ourselves, other life forms, our planet, and the universe. The word science is derived from a Latin verb meaning to know. Striving to understand seems to be one of our basic urges. At the heart of science is Inquiry, the search for information and explanations of natural phenomena. There is no formula for successful scientific inquiry, no single scientific method that researchers must rigidly follow. As in all quests, science includes elements of challenge, adventure, and luck, along with careful planning, reasoning, creativity, patience, and the persistence to overcome setbacks. Such diverse elements of inquiry make science far less structured than most people realize. 
That said, it is possible to highlight certain characteristics that help to distinguish science from other ways of describing and explaining nature. Scientists use a process of inquiry that includes making observations, forming logical, testable explanations, hypotheses, and testing them. The process is necessarily repetitive, in testing a hypothesis, more observations may inspire revision of the original hypothesis or formation of a new one, thus leading to further testing. In this way, scientists circle closer and closer to their best estimation of the laws governing nature. Exploration and Observation Biology, like other sciences, begins with careful observations. In gathering information, biologists often use tools such as microscopes, precision thermometers, or high-speed cameras that extend their senses or facilitate careful measurement. Observations can reveal valuable information about the natural world. For example, a series of detailed observations have shaped our understanding of cell structure, and another set of observations is currently expanding our databases of genome sequences from diverse species and databases of genes whose expression is altered in various diseases. In exploring nature, biologists also rely heavily on the scientific literature, the published contributions of fellow scientists. By reading about and understanding past studies, scientists can build on the foundation of existing knowledge, focusing their investigations on observations that are original and on hypotheses that are consistent with previous findings. Identifying publications relevant to a new line of research is now easier than at any point in the past, thanks to indexed and searchable electronic databases. Gathering and Analyzing Data Recorded observations are called Data Put another way, data are items of information on which scientific inquiry is based. The term data implies numbers to many people. But some data are qualitative, often in the form of recorded descriptions rather than numerical measurements. For example, Jane Goodall spent decades recording her observations of chimpanzee behavior during field research in a Tanzanian jungle. Figure 1.21 In her studies, Goodall also enriched the field of animal behavior with volumes of quantitative data, such as the frequency and duration of specific behaviors for different members of a group of chimpanzees in a variety of situations. Quantitative data are generally expressed as numerical measurements and often organized into tables and graphs. Scientists analyze their data using a type of mathematics called statistics to test whether their results are significant or merely due to random fluctuations. All results presented in this text have been shown to be statistically significant. Figure 1.21 Jane Goodall collecting qualitative data on chimpanzee behavior. Goodall recorded her observations in field notebooks, often with sketches of the animal's behavior. Mastering Biology Interview with Jane Goodall, Living with Chimpanzees Collecting and analyzing observations can lead to important conclusions based on a type of logic called Inductive Reasoning Through induction, we derive generalizations from a large number of specific observations. The sun always rises in the east is one example. Another biological example is the generalization all organisms are made of cells, which was based on two centuries of microscopic observations made by biologists examining cells in diverse biological specimens. Careful observations and data analyses, along with generalizations reached by induction, are fundamental to our understanding of nature. Forming and testing hypotheses Our innate curiosity often stimulates us to pose questions about the natural basis for the phenomena we observe in the world. What caused the different chimpanzee behaviors observed in the wild? What explains the variation in coat color among the mice of a single species, shown in Figure 1.1? Answering such questions usually involves forming and testing logical explanations that is, hypotheses. In science, a hypothesis is an explanation, based on observations and assumptions, that leads to a testable prediction. Said another way, a hypothesis is an explanation on trial. The hypothesis is usually a rational accounting for a set of observations, based on the available data and guided by inductive reasoning. A scientific hypothesis must lead to predictions that can be tested by making additional observations or by performing experiments. An experiment is a scientific test, carried out under controlled conditions. We all make observations and develop questions and hypotheses in solving everyday problems. Let's say, for example, that your desk lamp is plugged in and turned on but the bulb isn't lit. That's an observation. The question is obvious, why doesn't the lamp work? Two reasonable hypotheses based on your experience are that, one, the bulb is burnt out or, two, the bulb is not screwed in properly. Each of these alternative hypotheses leads to predictions you can test with experiments. For example, the burnt out bulb hypothesis predicts that replacing the bulb will fix the problem. Figure 1.22 diagrams this informal inquiry. 
Figuring things out in this way by trial and error is a hypothesis-based approach. Figure 1.22 A simplified view of the scientific process. The idealized process sometimes called the scientific method is shown in this flow chart, which illustrates hypothesis testing for a desk lamp that doesn't work. Figure 1.22 Full alternative text. Deductive reasoning. A type of logic called deduction is also built into the use of hypotheses in science. While induction entails reasoning from a set of specific observations to reach a general conclusion. Deductive reasoning involves logic that flows in the opposite direction, from the general to the specific. From general premises, we extrapolate to the specific results we should expect if the premises are true. In the scientific process, deductions usually take the form of predictions of results that will be found if a particular hypothesis, premise, is correct. We then test the hypothesis by carrying out experiments or observations to see whether or not the results are as predicted. This deductive testing takes the form of if-then logic. In the case of the desk lamp example, if the burnt-out bulb hypothesis is correct, then the lamp should work if you replace the bulb with a new one. We can use the desk lamp example to illustrate two other key points about the use of hypotheses in science. First, one can always devise additional hypotheses to explain a set of observations. For instance, another hypothesis to explain our non-working desk lamp is that the wall socket is faulty. Although you could design an experiment to test this hypothesis, you can never test all possible hypotheses. Second, we can never prove that a hypothesis is true. Suppose that replacing the bulb fixed the lamp. The burnt out bulb hypothesis would be the most likely explanation, but testing supports that hypothesis not by proving that it is correct, but rather by failing to prove it incorrect. For example, even if replacing the bulb fixed the desk lamp, it might have been because there was a temporary power outage that just happened to end while the bulb was being changed. Although a hypothesis can never be proved beyond all doubt, testing it in various ways can significantly increase our confidence in its validity. Often, Rounds of hypothesis formulation and testing lead to a scientific consensus the shared conclusion of many scientists that a particular hypothesis explains the known data well and stands up to experimental testing. Questions that can and cannot be addressed by science Scientific inquiry is a powerful way to learn about nature, but there are limitations to the kinds of questions it can answer. A scientific hypothesis must be testable, there must be some observation or experiment that could reveal if such an idea is likely to be true or false. The hypothesis that a burnt-out bulb is the sole reason the lamp doesn't work would not be supported if replacing the bulb with a new one didn't fix the lamp. Not all hypotheses meet the criteria of science, you wouldn't be able to test the hypothesis that invisible ghosts are fooling with your desk lamp. Because science only deals with natural, testable explanations for natural phenomena, it can neither support nor contradict the invisible ghost hypothesis, nor whether spirits or elves cause storms, rainbows, or illnesses. Such supernatural explanations are simply outside the bounds of science, as are religious matters, which are issues of personal faith. Science and religion are not mutually exclusive or contradictory, they are simply concerned with different issues. The flexibility of the scientific process The way that researchers answer questions about the natural and physical world is often idealized as the scientific method. However, very few scientific inquiries adhere rigidly to the sequence of steps that are typically used to describe this approach. For example, a scientist may start to design an experiment, but then backtrack after realizing that more preliminary observations are necessary. In other cases, observations remain too puzzling to prompt well-defined questions until further study provides a new context in which to view those observations. For example, scientists could not unravel the details of how genes encode proteins until after the discovery of the structure of DNA, an event that took place in 1953. A more realistic model of the scientific process is shown in Figure 1.23. The focus of this model, shown in the central circle in the figure, is the forming and testing of hypotheses. This core set of activities is the reason that science does so well in explaining phenomena in the natural world. These activities, however, are shaped by exploration and discovery, the upper circle in Figure 1.23, and influenced by interactions with other scientists and with society more generally, lower circles. For example, the community of scientists influences which hypotheses are tested, how test results are interpreted, and what value is placed on the findings. Similarly, societal needs such as the push to cure cancer or understand the process of climate change may help shape what research projects are funded and how extensively the results are discussed. Figure 1.23 The Process of Science, a Realistic Model In reality, the process of science is not linear, but instead involves backtracking, repetitions, and feedback between different parts of the process. This illustration is based on a model, How Science Works, from the website Understanding Science. 
www.understandingscience.org Figure 1.23 Full Alternative Text Now that we have highlighted the key features of scientific inquiry making observations and forming and testing hypotheses you should be able to recognize these features in a case study of actual scientific research. A case study in scientific inquiry, investigating coat coloration in mouse populations. Our case study begins with a set of observations and inductive generalizations. Color patterns of animals vary widely in nature, sometimes even among members of the same species. What accounts for such variation? As you may recall, the two mice depicted at the beginning of this chapter are members of the same species, Peromyscus polionotus, but they have different coat, fur, color patterns and reside in different environments. The beach mouse lives along the Florida seashore, a habitat of brilliant white sand dunes with sparse clumps of beach grass. The inland mouse lives on darker, more fertile soil farther inland. Figure 1.24 Even a brief glance at the photographs in Figure 1.24 reveals a striking match of mouse coloration to its habitat. The natural predators of these mice, including hawks, owls, foxes, and coyotes, are all visual hunters, they use their sense of sight to look for prey. It was logical, therefore, for Francis Bertity Sumner, a naturalist studying populations of these mice in the 1920s, to form the hypothesis that their coloration patterns had evolved as adaptations that camouflage the mice in their native environments, protecting them from predation. Figure 1.24 Different coloration in beach and inland populations of Peromyscus polionotus. Figure 1.24 Full alternative text. As obvious as the camouflage hypothesis may seem, it still required testing. In 2010, biologist Hopi Hoekstra of Harvard University and a group of her students headed to Florida to test the prediction that mice with coloration that did not match their habitat would be preyed on more heavily than the native, well-matched mice. Figure 1.25 summarizes this field experiment, introducing a format we will use throughout the book to walk through other examples of biological inquiry. Figure 1.25 Inquiry, Does Camouflage Affect Predation Rates on Two Populations of Mice? Experiment Hopi Hoekstra and colleagues tested the hypothesis that coat coloration provides camouflage that protects beach and inland populations of Peromyscus polionotus mice from predation in their habitats. The researchers spray-painted mouse models with light or dark color patterns that matched those of the beach and inland mice and placed models with each of the patterns in both habitats. The next morning, they counted damaged or missing models. Results for each habitat, the researchers calculated the percentage of attacked models that were camouflaged or non-camouflaged. In both habitats, the models whose pattern did not match their surroundings suffered much higher predation than did the camouflaged models. 1.326 Full Alternative Text Conclusion Conclusion The results are consistent with Consistent with Deductive reasoning. A type of logic called deduction is also built into the use of hypotheses in science. While induction entails reasoning from a set of specific observations to reach a general conclusion. Deductive reasoning involves logic that flows in the opposite direction, from the general to the specific. From general premises, we extrapolate to the specific results we should expect if the premises are true. In the scientific process, deductions usually take the form of predictions of results that will be found if a particular hypothesis, premise, is correct. We then test the hypothesis by carrying out experiments or observations to see whether or not the results are as predicted. This deductive testing takes the form of if-then logic. In the case of the desk lamp example, 
if the burnt out bulb hypothesis is correct, then the lamp should work if you replace the bulb with a new one. We can use the desk lamp example to illustrate two other key points about the use of hypotheses in science. First, one can always devise additional hypotheses to explain a set of observations. For instance, another hypothesis to explain our non-working desk lamp is that the wall socket is faulty. Although you could design an experiment to test this hypothesis, you can never test all possible hypotheses. Second, we can never prove that a hypothesis is true. Suppose that replacing the bulb fixed the lamp. The burnt out bulb hypothesis would be the most likely explanation, but testing supports that hypothesis not by proving that it is correct, but rather by failing to prove it incorrect. For example, even if replacing the bulb fixed the desk lamp, it might have been because there was a temporary power outage that just happened to end while the bulb was being changed. Although a hypothesis can never be proved beyond all doubt, testing it in various ways can significantly increase our confidence in its validity. Often, rounds of hypothesis formulation and testing lead to a scientific consensus the shared conclusion of many scientists that a particular hypothesis explains the known data well and stands up to experimental testing. Questions that can and cannot be addressed by science Scientific inquiry is a powerful way to learn about nature, but there are limitations to the kinds of questions it can answer. A scientific hypothesis must be testable, there must be some observation or experiment that could reveal if such an idea is likely to be true or false. The hypothesis that a burnt out bulb is the sole reason the lamp doesn't work would not be supported if replacing the bulb with a new one didn't fix the lamp. Not all hypotheses meet the criteria of science, you wouldn't be able to test the hypothesis that invisible ghosts are fooling with your desk lamp. Because science only deals with natural, testable explanations for natural phenomena, it can neither support nor contradict the invisible ghost hypothesis, nor whether spirits or elves cause storms, rainbows, or illnesses. Such supernatural explanations are simply outside the bounds of science, as are religious matters, which are issues of personal faith. Science and religion are not mutually exclusive or contradictory, they are simply concerned with different issues. The flexibility of the scientific process The way that researchers answer questions about the natural and physical world is often idealized as the scientific method. However, very few scientific inquiries adhere rigidly to the sequence of steps that are typically used to describe this approach. For example, a scientist may start to design an experiment, but then backtrack after realizing that more preliminary observations are necessary. In other cases, observations remain too puzzling to prompt well-defined questions until further study provides a new context in which to view those observations. For example, scientists could not unravel the details of how genes encode proteins until after the discovery of the structure of DNA, an event that took place in 1953. A more realistic model of the scientific process is shown in Figure 1.23 The focus of this model, shown in the central circle in the figure, is the forming and testing of hypotheses. This core set of activities is the reason that science does so well in explaining phenomena in the natural world. These activities, however, are shaped by exploration and discovery, the upper circle in Figure 1.23, and influenced by interactions with other scientists and with society more generally, lower circles. For example, the community of scientists influences which hypotheses are tested, how test results are interpreted, and what value is placed on the findings. Similarly, societal needs such as the push to cure cancer or understand the process of climate change may help shape what research projects are funded and how extensively the results are discussed. Figure 1.23 The Process of Science, a Realistic Model In reality, the process of science is not linear, but instead involves backtracking, repetitions, and feedback between different parts of the process. This illustration is based on a model, How Science Works, from the website Understanding Science. www.understandingscience.org Figure 1.23 Full Alternative Text Now that we have highlighted the key features of scientific inquiry making observations and forming and testing hypotheses you should be able to recognize these features in a case study of actual scientific research. A case study in scientific inquiry investigating coat coloration in mouse populations. Our case study begins with a set of observations notice, but they have different coat, fur, color patterns and reside in different environments. The beach mouse lives along the Florida seashore, a habitat of brilliant white sand dunes with sparse clumps of beach grass. The inland mouse lives on darker, more fertile soil farther inland. Figure 1.24 Even a brief glance at the photographs in Figure 1.24 reveals a striking match of mouse coloration to its habitat. The natural predators of these mice, including hawks, owls, foxes, and coyotes, are all visual hunters, they use their sense of sight to look for prey. It was logical, 
therefore, for Francis Bertity Sumner, a naturalist studying populations of these mice in the 1920s, to form the hypothesis that their coloration patterns had evolved as adaptations that camouflage the mice in their native environments, protecting them from predation. Figure 1.24 Different coloration in beach and inland populations of Peromiscus polionotus. Figure 1.24 Full alternative text. As obvious as the camouflage hypothesis may seem, it still required testing. In 2010, biologist Hopi Hoekstra of Harvard University and a group of her students headed to Florida to test the prediction that mice with coloration that did not match their habitat would be preyed on more heavily than the native, well-matched mice. Figure 1.25 summarizes this field experiment, introducing a format we will use throughout the book to walk through other examples of biological inquiry. Figure 1.25 Inquiry does camouflage affect predation rates on two populations of mice? Experiment Hopi Hoekstra and colleagues tested the hypothesis that coat coloration provides camouflage that protects beach and inland populations of Peromiscus polionotus mice from predation in their habitats. The researchers spray painted mouse models with light or dark color patterns that matched those of the beach and inland mice and placed models with each of the patterns in both habitats. The next morning, they counted damaged or missing models. Results for each habitat the researchers calculated the percentage of attacked models that were camouflaged or non-camouflaged. In both habitats, the models whose pattern did not match their surroundings suffered much higher predation than did the camouflaged models. 1.326 Full Alternative Text Conclusion The results are consistent with the researchers' prediction, that mouse models with camouflage coloration would be attacked less often than non-camouflaged mouse models. Thus, the experiment supports the camouflage hypothesis. Data from S. N. Veneri J.G. Larson, and H.E. Hoekstra, The Selective Advantage of Crypsis in Mice, Evolution 64 2153, 2158, 2010. Interpret the data the bars indicate the percentage of the attacked models that were either light or dark. Assume 100 mouse models were attacked in each habitat. For the beach habitat, how many were light models? Dark models? Answer the same questions for the inland habitat. Do the results of the experiment support the camouflage hypothesis? Explain. Mastering Biology Interview with Hopi Hoekstra, Investigating the Genetics and Natural Selection of Mouse Coat Color The researchers built hundreds of models of mice and spray-painted them to resemble either beach or inland mice, so that the models differed only in their color patterns. The researchers placed equal numbers of these model mice randomly in both habitats and left them overnight. The mouse models resembling the native mice in the habitat were the control group, for instance, light-colored mouse models in the beach habitat, while the mouse models with the non-native coloration were the experimental group, for example, darker models in the beach habitat. The following morning, the team counted and recorded signs of predation events, which ranged from bites and gouge marks on some models to the outright disappearance of others. Judging by the shape of the predators' bites and the tracks surrounding the experimental sites, the predators appeared to be split fairly evenly between mammals, such as foxes and coyotes, and birds, such as owls, herons, and hawks. For each environment, the researchers then calculated the percentage of predation events that targeted camouflaged models. The results were clear-cut, camouflaged models showed much lower predation rates than those lacking camouflage in both the beach habitat, where light mice were less vulnerable, and the inland habitat, where dark mice were less vulnerable. The data thus fit the key prediction of the camouflage hypothesis. Variables and controls in experiments In carrying out an experiment, a researcher often manipulates one factor in a system and observes the effects of this change. The mouse camouflage experiment described in Figure 1.25 is an example of a Controlled experiment, one that is designed to compare an experimental group, the non-camouflaged mice models, in this case, with a control group, the camouflaged models. Both the factor that is manipulated and the factor that is subsequently measured are Variables a feature or quantity that varies in an experiment. In our example, the color of the mouse model was the independent variable the factor being manipulated by the researchers. The dependent variable is the factor being measured that is predicted to be affected by the independent variable, in this case, the researchers measured the amount of predation in response to variation in color of the mouse model. Note also that the experimental and control groups differ in only one independent variable, color. As a result, the researchers could rule out other factors as causes of the more frequent attacks on the non-camouflaged mice such as different numbers of predators or different temperatures in the different test areas. The clever experimental design left coloration as the only factor that could account for the low predation rate on models camouflaged with respect to the surrounding environment. 
A common misconception is that the term controlled experiment means that scientists control all features of the experimental environment. But that's impossible in field research and can be very difficult even in highly regulated laboratory environments. Researchers usually control unwanted variables not by eliminating them through environmental regulation, but by cancelling out their effects by using control groups. Mastering Biology Animation, Introduction to Experimental Design Theories in Science It's just a theory. Our everyday use of the term theory often implies an untested speculation. But the term theory has a different meaning in science. What is a scientific theory, and how is it different from a hypothesis or from mere speculation? First, a scientific theory is much broader in scope than a hypothesis. This is a hypothesis, code coloration well matched to their habitat is an adaptation that protects mice from predators. But this is a theory, evolutionary adaptations arise by natural selection. This theory proposes that natural selection is the evolutionary mechanism that accounts for an enormous variety of adaptations, of which code color in mice is but one example. Second, a theory is general enough to spin off many new, testable hypotheses. For example, the theory of natural selection motivated two researchers at Princeton University, Peter and Rosemary Grant, to test the specific hypothesis that the beaks of Galapagos finches evolve in response to changes in the types of available food. Their results supported their hypothesis, see. Figure 23.2 And third, compared to any one hypothesis, a theory is generally supported by a much greater body of evidence. The theory of natural selection has been supported by a vast quantity of evidence, with more being found every day, and has not been contradicted by any scientific data. Those theories that become widely adopted in science, such as the theory of natural selection and the theory of gravity, explain a great diversity of observations and are supported by a vast accumulation of evidence. Finally, Scientists will sometimes modify or even reject a previously supported theory if new research consistently produces results that don't fit. For example, biologists once lumped bacteria and archaea together as a kingdom of prokaryotes. When new methods for comparing cells and molecules could be used to test such relationships, the evidence led scientists to reject the theory that bacteria and archaea are members of the same kingdom. If there is truth in science, it is at best conditional, based on the weight of available evidence. Concept Check 1.3 what qualitative observation led to the quantitative study in Figure 1.25 Contrast inductive reasoning with deductive reasoning Why is natural selection called a theory? What if In the deserts of New Mexico, the soils are mostly sandy, with occasional regions of black rock derived from lava flows that occurred about 1,000 years ago. Mice are found in both sandy and rocky areas, and owls are known predators. What might you expect about coat color in these two mouse populations? Explain. How would you use this ecosystem to further test the camouflage hypothesis? For suggested answers, see. Appendix A. Concept 1.4 Science Benefits from a Cooperative Approach and Diverse Viewpoints Movies and cartoons sometimes portray scientists as loners in white lab coats, working in isolated labs. In reality, science is an intensely social activity. Most scientists work in teams, which often include both graduate and undergraduate students. And to succeed in science, it helps to be a good communicator. Research results have no impact until shared with a community of peers through seminars, publications, and websites. And, in fact, research papers aren't published until they are vetted by colleagues in what is called the peer review process. The examples of scientific inquiry described in this book, for instance, have all been published in peer review journals. Building on the work of others The great scientist Isaac Newton once said, to explain all nature is too difficult a task for any one man or even for any one age. Tis much better to do a little with certainty, and leave the rest for others that come after you. Anyone who becomes a scientist, driven by curiosity about how nature works, is sure to benefit greatly from the rich storehouse of discoveries by others who have come before. In fact, Hopi Hoekstra's experiment benefited from the work of another researcher, D.W. Kaufman, 40 years earlier. You can study the design of Kaufman's experiment and interpret the results in the Scientific Skills Exercise Scientific results are continually scrutinized through the repetition of observations and experiments. Scientists working in the same research field often check one another's claims by attempting to confirm observations or repeat experiments. If scientific colleagues cannot repeat experimental findings, 
this failure may reflect some underlying weakness in the original claim, which will then have to be revised. In this sense, science polices itself. Integrity and adherence to high professional standards in reporting results are central to the scientific endeavor, since the validity of experimental data is key to designing further lines of inquiry. It is not unusual for several scientists to converge on the same research question. Some scientists enjoy the challenge of being first with an important discovery or key experiment, while others derive more satisfaction from cooperating with fellow scientists working on the same problem. Cooperation is facilitated when scientists use the same organism. Often, it is a widely used model organism a species that is easy to grow in the lab and lends itself particularly well to the questions being investigated. Because all species are evolutionarily related, such an organism may be viewed as a model for understanding the biology of other species and their diseases. Genetic studies of the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster, for example, have taught us a lot about how genes work in other species, even humans. Some other popular model organisms are the mustard plant Arabidopsis thaliana, the soil worm Sinorabditis elegans, the zebrafish Dania rerio, the mouse Muse musculus, and the bacterium Escherichia coli. As you read through this book, note the many contributions that these and other model organisms have made to the study of life. Biologists may approach interesting questions from different angles. Some biologists focus on ecosystems, while others study natural phenomena at the level of organisms or cells. This text is divided into units that look at biology at different levels and investigate problems through different approaches. Yet any given problem can be addressed from many perspectives, which in fact complement each other. For example, Hoekstra not only carried out field studies showing that coat coloration can affect predation rates but also did lab studies that uncovered at least one genetic mutation that underlies the differences between beach and inland mouse coloration. Her lab includes biologists specializing in different biological levels, allowing links to be made between the evolutionary adaptations she focuses on and their molecular basis in DNA sequences. As a biology student, you can benefit from making connections between the different levels of biology. You can develop this skill by noticing when certain topics crop up again and again in different units. One such topic is sickle cell disease, a well-understood genetic condition that is prevalent among native inhabitants of Africa and other warm regions and their descendants. Sickle cell disease will appear in several units of the text, each time addressed at a new level. In addition, make connections figures connect the content in different chapters, and make connections questions ask you to make the connections yourselves. We hope these features will help you integrate the material you're learning and enhance your enjoyment of biology by encouraging you to keep the big picture in mind. Scientific Skills Exercise Interpreting a Pair of Bar Graphs How much does camouflage affect predation on mice by owls with and without moonlight? D.W. Kaufman hypothesized that the extent to which the coat color of a mouse contrasted with the color of its surroundings would affect the rate of nighttime predation by owls. He also hypothesized that the contrast would be affected by the amount of moonlight. In this exercise, you will analyze data from his studies of owl predation on mice that tested these hypotheses. How the experiment was done Pairs of mice, Peromiscus polionotus, with different coat colors, one light brown and one dark brown, were released simultaneously into an enclosure that contained a hungry owl. The researcher recorded the color of the mouse that was first caught by the owl. If the owl did not catch either mouse within 15 minutes, the test was recorded as a zero. The release trials were repeated multiple times in enclosures with either a dark-colored soil surface or a light-colored soil surface. The presence or absence of moonlight during each assay was recorded. Data from the experiment Data from D.W. Kaufman, Adaptive Coloration in Peromiscus Polionotus, Experimental Selection by Owls, Journal of Mammalogy 55,271, 283, 1974. One point four to nine full alternative text. Interpret the data. First, make sure you understand how the graphs are set up. Graph A shows data from the light-colored soil enclosure and graph B from the dark-colored enclosure, but in all other respects the graphs are the same. A. There is more than one independent variable in these graphs. What are the independent variables? the variables that were tested by the researcher. Which axis of the graphs has the independent variables? B. What is the dependent variable, the response to the variables being tested? Which axis of the graphs has the dependent variable? A. How many dark brown mice were caught in the light-colored soil enclosure on a moonlit night? B. How many dark brown mice were caught in the dark-colored soil enclosure on a moonlit night? C. On a moonlit night, would a dark brown mouse be more likely to escape predation by owls on dark or light-colored soil? Explain your answer. A. Is a dark brown mouse on dark colored soil more likely to escape predation under a full moon or with no moon? B. What about a light brown mouse on light colored soil? Explain. A. 
under which conditions would a dark brown mouse be most likely to escape predation at night? b. A light brown mouse. a. What combination of independent variables led to the highest predation level in enclosures with light-colored soil? b. What combination of independent variables led to the highest predation level in enclosures with dark-colored soil? Thinking about your answers to question 5, provide a simple statement describing conditions that are especially deadly for either color of mouse. Combining the data from both graphs, estimate the number of mice caught in moonlight versus no moonlight conditions. Which condition is optimal for predation by the owl? Explain. Instructors, a version of the scientific skills exercise can be assigned in mastering biology, science, technology, and society. The research community is part of society at large, and the relationship of science to society becomes clearer when we add technology to the picture, see. Figure 1.23 Though science and technology sometimes employ similar inquiry patterns, their basic goals differ. The goal of science is to understand natural phenomena, while that of technology is to apply scientific knowledge for some specific purpose. Because scientists put new technology to work in their research, science and technology are interdependent. The potent combination of science and technology can have dramatic effects on society. Sometimes, the applications of basic research that turn out to be the most beneficial come out of the blue, from completely unanticipated observations in the course of scientific exploration. For example, discovery of the structure of DNA by Watson and Crick in 1953 and subsequent achievements in DNA science led to the technologies of DNA manipulation that are transforming applied fields such as medicine, agriculture, and forensics. Figure 1.26 Perhaps Watson and Crick envisioned that their discovery would someday lead to important applications, but it is unlikely that they could have predicted exactly what all those applications would be. Figure 1.26 DNA Technology and Forensics Since 1992, the Innocence Project has used forensic analysis of DNA samples from crime scenes to exonerate over 360 wrongly convicted prisoners. Most had served many years in prison. To read about the four people shown here who were found to be innocent, go to the Innocence Project website. The directions that technology takes depend less on the curiosity that drives basic science than on the current needs and wants of people and on the social environment of the times. Debates about technology center more on should we do it than can we do it? With advances in technology come difficult choices. For example, under what circumstances is it acceptable to use DNA technology to find out if particular people have genes for hereditary diseases? Should such tests always be voluntary, or are there circumstances when genetic testing should be mandatory? Should insurance companies or employers have access to the information, as they do for many other types of personal health data? These questions are becoming much more urgent as the sequencing of individual genomes becomes quicker and cheaper. Ethical issues raised by such questions have as much to do with politics, economics, and cultural values as with science and technology. All citizens not only professional scientists have a responsibility to be informed about how science works and about the potential benefits and risks of technology. The relationship between science, technology, and society increases the significance and value of any biology course. The value of diverse viewpoints in science Many of the technological innovations with the most profound impact on human society originated in settlements along trade routes, where a rich mix of different cultures ignited new ideas. For example, the printing press, which helped spread knowledge to all social classes, was invented by the German Johannes Gutenberg around 1440. This invention relied on several innovations from China, including paper and ink. Paper traveled along trade routes from China to Baghdad, where technology was developed for its mass production. This technology then migrated to Europe, as did water-based ink from China, which was modified by Gutenberg to become oil-based ink. We have the cross-fertilization of diverse cultures to thank for the printing press, and the same can be said for other important inventions. Along similar lines, science benefits from a diversity of backgrounds and viewpoints among its practitioners. But just how diverse a population are scientists in relation to gender, race, ethnicity, and other attributes? The scientific community reflects the cultural standards and behaviors of the society around it. It is therefore not surprising that until recently, women, people of color, and other underrepresented groups have faced huge obstacles in their pursuit to become professional scientists in many countries around the world. Over the past 50 years, changing attitudes about career choices have increased the proportion of women in biology and some other sciences, so that now women constitute roughly half of undergraduate biology majors and biology PhD students. The pace has been slow at higher levels in the profession, however, and women and many racial and ethnic groups are still significantly underrepresented in many branches of science and technology. This lack of diversity hampers the progress of science. 
the more voices that are heard at the table, the more robust, valuable, and productive the scientific interchange will be. The authors of this text welcome all students to the community of biologists, wishing you the joys and satisfactions of this exciting field of science. Concept Check 1.4 How does science differ from technology? Make connections The gene that causes sickle cell disease is present in a higher percentage of residents of sub-Saharan Africa than among those of African descent living in the United States. Even though this... Summary of key concepts To review key terms Terms, go to the vocabulary self-quiz in the Mastering Biology e-text or study area, or go to Area, or go to goo.gl slash zkjz90 goo.gl slash zkjz90 Go to Mastering Biology for assignments, the e-text, the study area, and dynamic study modules. Concept 1.1 The study of life reveals unifying themes, pp. 3. 11. Organization theme, new properties emerge at successive levels of biological organization. The hierarchy of life unfolds as follows. Biosphere Ecosystem Community Population Organism Organ System Organ Tissue Cell Organ L Molecule Atom With each step from atoms to the biosphere, new emergent properties result from interactions among components at the lower levels. In an approach called reductionism, complex systems are broken down to simpler components that are more manageable to study. In systems biology, scientists attempt to model the dynamic behavior of whole biological systems by studying the interactions among the system's parts. Structure and function are correlated at all levels of biological organization. The cell, an organism's basic unit of structure and function, is the lowest level that can perform all activities required for life. Cells are either prokaryotic or eukaryotic. Eukaryotic cells have a DNA-containing nucleus and other membrane-enclosed organelles. Prokaryotic cells lack such organelles. Information theme, life's processes involve the expression and transmission of genetic information. Genetic information is encoded in the nucleotide sequences of DNA. It is DNA that transmits heritable information from parents to offspring. DNA sequences, called genes, program a cell's protein production by being transcribed into mRNA and then translated into specific proteins, a process called gene expression. Gene expression also produces RNAs that are not translated into protein but serve other important functions. Genomics is the large-scale analysis of the DNA sequences of a species, its genome, as well as the comparison of genomes between species. Bioinformatics uses computational tools to deal with huge volumes of sequence data. Energy and matter theme, life requires the transfer and transformation of energy and matter. Energy flows through an ecosystem. All organisms must perform work, which requires energy. Producers convert energy from sunlight to chemical energy, some of which is used by them and by consumers to do work, and is eventually lost from the ecosystem as heat. Chemical cycle between organisms and the interactions theme, from molecules to ecosystems, interactions are important in biological systems is regulated by its output or end product. In negative feedback, accumulation of the end product slows its production. In positive feedback, an end product speeds up its own production. Or interact continuously with physical factors. Plants take up nutrients from the soil and chemicals from the air and use energy from the sun. Thinking about the muscles and nerves in your hand, how does the activity of text messaging reflect the four unifying themes of biology described in this section? Concept 1.2 The core theme, evolution accounts for the unity and diversity of life, pp. 11. 16. Evolution, the process of change that has transformed life on Earth, accounts for the unity and diversity of life. It also explains evolutionary adaptation the match of organisms to their environments. Biologists classify species according to a system of broader and broader groups. Domain bacteria and domain archaea consist of prokaryotes. Domain eukarya, the eukaryotes, 
includes various groups of protists and the kingdom's plantae, fungi, and animalia. As diverse as life is, there is also evidence of remarkable unity, revealed in the similarities between different species. Darwin proposed natural selection as the mechanism for evolutionary adaptation of populations to their environments. Natural selection is the evolutionary process that occurs when a population is exposed to environmental factors that consistently cause individuals with certain heritable traits to have greater reproductive success than do individuals with other heritable traits. 1.2-16 Full Alternative Text Each species is one twig of a branching tree of life extending back in time through more and more remote ancestral species. All of life is connected through its long evolutionary history. How could natural selection have led to the evolution of adaptations such as camouflaging coat color in beach mice? Concept 1.3 In Studying Nature, Scientists Form, and Test Hypotheses, pp. 16. 22. In scientific inquiry, scientists collect data and use inductive reasoning to draw a general conclusion, which can be developed into a testable hypothesis. Deductive reasoning uses predictions to test hypotheses. Hypotheses must be testable, science can address neither the possibility of supernatural phenomena nor religious beliefs. Hypotheses can be tested by conducting experiments or, when that is not possible, by making observations. In the process of science, the core activity is testing ideas. This endeavor is influenced by exploration and discovery, community analysis, and feedback, and societal outcomes. Controlled experiments are designed to demonstrate the effect of one variable by testing control groups and experimental groups that differ in only that one variable. A scientific theory is brought in scope, generates new hypotheses, and is supported by a large body of evidence. What are the roles of gathering and interpreting data? Concept 1.4 Science Benefits from a Cooperative Approach and Diverse Viewpoints, pp. 22. 24. Science is a social activity. The work of each scientist builds on the work of others who have come before. Scientists must be able to repeat each other's results, and integrity is key. Biologists approach questions at different levels, their approaches complement each other. Technology consists of any method or device that applies scientific knowledge for some specific purpose that affects society. The impact of basic research is not always immediately obvious. Diversity among scientists promotes progress in science. Explain why different approaches and diverse backgrounds among scientists are important. Test your understanding. For more multiple choice questions, go to the practice test in the Mastering Biology e-text or study area, or go to goo.gl slash grwrg. Levels 1 to 2. Remembering slash understanding. All the organisms on your campus make up an ecosystem, a community, a population, a taxonomic domain. Systems biology is mainly an attempt to analyze genomes from different species. Simplify complex problems by reducing the system into smaller, less complex units. Understand the behavior of entire biological systems by studying interactions among its component parts. Build high-throughput machines to rapidly acquire data. Which of these best demonstrates unity among organisms? Emergent properties. Descent with modification. The structure and function of DNA. Natural selection. A controlled experiment is one that Proceed slowly so a scientist can make careful records. Test experimental and control groups in parallel. Is repeated many times to make sure the results are accurate. Keeps all variables constant. Which of the following statements best distinguishes hypotheses from theories in science? Theories are hypotheses that have been proved. Hypotheses are guesses, theories are correct answers. Hypotheses usually are relatively narrow in scope, theories have broad explanatory power. Theories are proved true, hypotheses are often contradicted by experimental results. Levels 3 to 4, Applying slash Analyzing Which of the following is an example of qualitative data? The fish swam in a zigzag motion. The contents of the stomach are mixed every 20 seconds. The temperature decreased from 2. 
the six pairs of robins hatched an average of three chicks each. Which sentence best describes the logic of scientific inquiry? If I generate a testable hypothesis, tests and observations will support it. If my prediction is correct, it will lead to a testable hypothesis. If my observations are accurate, they will support my hypothesis. If my prediction turns out to be correct, my hypothesis is supported. Draw IT draw a biological hierarchy similar to the one in Figure 1.3 but using a coral reef as the ecosystem, a fish as the organism, its stomach as the organ, and DNA as the molecule. Include all levels in the hierarchy. Levels 5 to 6, Evaluating slash Creating Evolution connection A typical prokaryotic cell has about 3,000 genes in its DNA, while a human cell has about 21,300 genes. About 1,000 of these genes are present in both types of cells. Explain how such different organisms could have the same subset of 1,000 genes. What sorts of functions might these shared genes have? Scientific inquiry based on the results of the mouse coloration case study, suggest another hypothesis researchers might use to study the role of predators in natural selection. Synthesize your knowledge. Can you pick out the mossy leaf-tailed gecko lion? Unit 1 The Chemistry of Life Dr. Kenneth Olden recently retired from a long and distinguished career in medical research and public health, including serving as director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences from 1991 to 2005, as founding dean of the School of Public Health at the City University of New York from 2008 to 2012, and as director of the National Center for Environmental Assessment from 2012 to 2016. He has published over 220 research papers and has received many honors and awards, among them the three most distinguished awards in public health. Dr. Olden grew up in Parrotsville, Tennessee, the son of a sharecropper. He remembers walking up a long hill to high school every morning and daydreaming about helping the poor people both black and white in the neighborhoods he'd walk through, wanting to make a difference. An interview with Kenneth Olden What got you interested in biology? I was always cerebral, I always liked to read and think. For me, role models were important. At that time, I knew about only two professions that blacks were in, medicine and teaching. There was one black physician in town unusual for a rural town. My high school principal he was black would tell us, by golly, you could be anything you want to be. I paid attention and listened. He helped me apply to Knoxville College, and I decided I would be a physician, so I majored in biology and minored in chemistry. Then, in my senior year, my professor at Knoxville he was interested in diversity got me into a research program at the University of Tennessee, which was not integrated at that time blacks couldn't attend. But I was allowed to do research on tapeworms, irradiate them and examine their chromosomes, and I was allowed to attend the seminars. I was fascinated by the research, I was just turned on finally, I realized this is what I'd really like to do. Dr. Olden established Children's Environmental Health and Disease Prevention Research Centers. Can you tell me about how you got into cancer research? After my PhD and my postdoctoral research at Harvard, I realized I wanted to work on animal cells, so I joined IRA Poston's group at the National Cancer Institute at the National Institutes of Health, where I eventually got my own lab together with Ken Yamada, I was working on a protein called fibronectin, which was present on the outside surface of normal cells but not cancer cells. Fibronectin is a glycoprotein it has carbohydrates, sugars, attached to it. At the time, there was a hypothesis that the carbohydrates were necessary for fibronectin to be exported from the cell, and we decided to test that hypothesis using a drug called tunicomycin that prevented carbohydrate attachment. We showed that carbohydrates weren't necessary for export, but instead they were important for stabilizing the protein structure. That turned out to be one of the most cited papers for 1978, it was huge. One of us from rural America had to make it and I thought, why not me? In 1991, you became director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. What were your goals and accomplishments there? When I interviewed for the position, I told the director of the NIH, my first priority would be to make the institute responsive to the needs of the American people. She immediately offered me the job and that changed my life. It gave me the opportunity to think big and to address a lot of issues I felt weren't being dealt with, kind of what I'd been dreaming of. Environmental health research at that time focused on chemical carcinogenesis, and I wanted to expand that focus to social and behavioral issues also, as well as genetics. Over my time there, I engaged communities in identifying areas of concern for our research, such as disproportionate exposure to chemicals in certain neighborhoods. I founded the Environmental Genome Project, 
which used a novel genomic approach to determine susceptibility to toxins. I also expanded environmental health centers around the country, developing the Breast Cancer and the Environment Research Program and Children's Environmental Health and Disease Prevention Research Centers. Children are really important to me they are especially susceptible to environmental toxins, and we needed to address that. What is your advice to an undergraduate considering a career in biology? Most people, I think, will figure out what is the right thing to do, but often it takes a lot of courage to do the right thing. When I accepted the Sackler Prize, I talked about walking to high school and realizing that government was making a lot of decisions that affected rural America without ever bothering to consult rural Americans. In order to change that, one of us from rural America had to make it and I thought, why not me? In being awarded the prize, for creating community-based participatory research, it looks like I actually succeeded in what I set out to do, to get the public health decision makers to pay attention to the needs of the poor. To the chemical context of life. Figure 2.1 Wood ants, for mycorrhiza, use chemistry to ward off enemies. When threatened from above, they shoot volleys of formic acid from their abdomens into the air. The acid bombards and stings potential predators, such as hungry birds. 2.1 to 1 full alternative text. Key concepts. 2.1 matter consists of chemical elements in pure form and in combinations called compounds. 29. 2.2 and elements properties depend on the structure of its atoms p. 30. 2.3 The formation and function of molecules and ionic compounds depend on chemical bonding between atoms. 36. 2.4 Chemical reactions make and break chemical bonds. 40. Study tip. Make a table, as you read the chapter, make a summary table like the following. Add more rows as you proceed. 2.1 to 2 Full alternative text. Go to Mastering Biology. For students, in e-text and study area. Get ready for Chapter 2 Figure 2.6 Walk through, energy levels of an atom's electrons. Animation, introduction to chemical bonds. For instructors to assign, in item library. Chemistry review, atoms and molecules, covalent bonds. Chemistry review, atoms and molecules, electronegativity. Concept 2.1 Matter consists of chemical elements in pure form and in combinations called compounds. Organisms are composed of Matter, which is anything that takes up space and has mass. Matter exists in many forms. Rocks, metals, oils, gases, and living organisms are a few examples of what seems to be an endless assortment of matter. Elements and Compounds Matter is made up of elements. Element is a substance that cannot be broken down to other substances by chemical reactions. Today, chemists recognize 92 elements occurring in nature, gold, copper, carbon, and oxygen are examples. Each element has a symbol, usually the first letter or two of its name. Some symbols are derived from Latin or German, for instance, the symbol for sodium is Na, from the Latin word natrium. A. Compound is a substance consisting of two or more different elements combined in a fixed ratio. Table salt, for example, is sodium chloride, NaCl, a compound composed of the elements sodium, Na, and chlorine, Cl, in a 1 colon 1 ratio. Pure sodium is a metal, and pure chlorine is a poisonous gas. When chemically combined, however, sodium and chlorine form an edible compound. Water, another compound, consists of the elements hydrogen, H, and oxygen, O, in a 2 colon 1 ratio. These are simple examples of organized matter having emergent properties. A compound has characteristics different from those of its elements. Figure 2.2 Figure 2.2 The emergent properties of a compound The metal sodium combines with the poisonous gas chlorine, forming the edible compound sodium chloride, or table salt. The elements of life Of the 92 natural elements, about 20 to 25 percent are Essential elements that an organism needs to live a healthy life and reproduce. The essential elements are similar among organisms, but there is some variation for example, 
humans need 25 elements, but plants need only 17. Just four elements oxygen, O, carbon, C, hydrogen, H, and nitrogen, N, make up approximately 96% of living matter. Calcium, Ca, phosphorus, P, potassium, K, sulfur, S, and a few other elements account for most of the remaining 4% or so of an organism's mass. Trace elements are required by an organism in only minute quantities. Some trace elements, such as iron, Fe, are needed by all forms of life, others are required only by certain species. For example, in vertebrates, animals with backbones, the element iodine, I, is an essential ingredient of a hormone produced by the thyroid gland. A daily intake of only 0.15 mg, mg, of iodine is adequate for normal activity of the human thyroid. An iodine deficiency in the diet causes the thyroid gland to grow to abnormal size, a condition called goiter. Consuming seafood or iodized salt reduces the incidence of goiter. Relative amounts of all the elements in the human body are listed in. Table 2.1 Table 2.1 Elements in the Human Body Trace elements, less than 0.01% of mass boron, B, chromium, Cr, cobalt, Co, copper, Cu, fluorine, F, iodine, I, iron, Fe, manganese, Mn, molybdenum, Mo, selenium, Se, silicon, Si, tin, Sn, vanadium, V, zinc, Zn. Table 2.1 Full Alternative Text Interpret the data given the makeup of the human body, what compound do you think accounts for the high percentage of oxygen? Some naturally occurring elements are toxic to organisms. In humans, for instance, the element arsenic has been linked to numerous diseases and can be lethal. In some areas of the world, arsenic occurs naturally and can make its way into the groundwater. As a result of using water from drilled wells in southern Asia, millions of people have been inadvertently exposed to arsenic-laden water. Efforts are underway to reduce arsenic levels in their water supply. Mastering Biology Case Study, Evolution of Tolerance to Toxic Elements Evolution Some species have become adapted to environments containing elements that are usually toxic, an example is serpentine plant communities. Serpentine is a jade-like mineral that contains elevated concentrations of elements such as chromium, nickel, and cobalt. Although most plants cannot survive in soil that forms from serpentine rock, a small number of plant species have adaptations that allow them to do so. Figure 2.3 Presumably, variants of ancestral, non-serpentine species arose that could survive in serpentine soils, and subsequent natural selection resulted in the distinctive array of species we see in these areas today. Serpentine-adapted plants are of great interest to researchers because studying them can teach us so much about natural selection and evolutionary adaptations on a local scale. Figure 2.3 Serpentine Plant Community These plants are growing on serpentine soil, which contains elements that are usually toxic to plants. The insets show a close-up of serpentine rock and one of the plants, a Tiburone mariposa lily, Calicardus tiburonensis. This specially adapted species is found only on this one hill in Tiburone, a peninsula that juts into San Francisco Bay. Concept Check 2.1 Make connections explain how table salt has emergent properties. C. Concept 1.1 Is a trace element an essential element? Explain. What if? In humans, iron is a trace element required for the proper functioning of hemoglobin, the molecule that carries oxygen in red blood cells. What might be the effects of an iron deficiency? Make connections explain how natural selection might have played a role in the evolution of species that are tolerant of serpentine soils. Review Concept 1.2 Four suggested answers, see Appendix A Concept 2.2 An element's properties depend on the structure of its atoms. Each element consists of a certain type of atom that is different from the atoms of any other element. An atom is the smallest unit of matter that still retains the properties of an element. Atoms are so small that it would take about a million of them to stretch across the period printed at the end of the sentence. We symbolize atoms with the same abbreviation used for the element that is made up of those atoms. For example, the symbol C stands for both the element carbon and a single carbon atom. Subatomic Particles Although the atom is the smallest unit having the properties of an element, these tiny bits of matter are composed of even smaller parts, called subatomic particles. Using high-energy collisions, 
physicists have produced more than 100 types of particles from the atom, but only three kinds of particles are relevant here. Neutrons Protons, and Electrons Protons and electrons are electrically charged. Each proton has one unit of positive charge, and each electron has one unit of negative charge. A neutron, as its name implies, is electrically neutral. Protons and neutrons are packed together tightly in a dense core, or atomic nucleus, at the center of an atom, protons give the nucleus a positive charge. The rapidly moving electrons form a cloud of negative charge around the nucleus, and it is the attraction between opposite charges that keeps the electrons in the vicinity of the nucleus. Figure 2.4 shows two commonly used models of the structure of the helium atom as an example. Figure 2.4 simplified models of a helium, he, atom. The helium nucleus consists of two neutrons, brown, and two protons, pink. Two electrons, yellow, exist outside the nucleus. These models are not to scale, they greatly overestimate the size of the nucleus in relation to the electron cloud. Figure 2.4 Full Alternative Text The neutron and proton are almost identical in mass, each about gram, g. Grams and other conventional units are not very useful for describing the mass of objects that are so minuscule. Thus, for atoms and subatomic particles, and for molecules, too, we use a unit of measurement called the Dalton, in honor of John Dalton, the British scientist who helped develop atomic theory around 1800. The Dalton is the same as the atomic mass unit, or AMU, a unit you may have encountered elsewhere. Neutrons and protons have masses close to one Dalton. Because the mass of an electron is only about 1 slash 2 comma 0 0 0 that of a neutron or proton, we can ignore electrons when computing the total mass of an atom. Atomic number and atomic mass Atoms of the various elements differ in their number of subatomic particles. All atoms of a particular element have the same number of protons in their nuclei. This number of protons, which is unique to that element, is called the atomic number and is written as a subscript to the left of the symbol for the element. The abbreviation, for example, tells us that an atom of the element helium has two protons in its nucleus. Unless otherwise indicated, an atom is neutral in electrical charge, which means that its protons must be balanced by an equal number of electrons. Therefore, the atomic number tells us the number of protons and also the number of electrons in an electrically neutral atom. We can deduce the number of neutrons from a second quantity, the mass number, which is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus of an atom. The mass number is written as a superscript to the left of an element's symbol. For example, we can use this shorthand to write an atom of helium as because the atomic number indicates how many protons there are, we can determine the number of neutrons by subtracting the atomic number from the mass number. In our example, the helium atom has two neutrons. For sodium, Na. 2.225 Full Alternative Text The simplest atom is hydrogen, which has no neutrons, it consists of a single proton with a single electron. Because the contribution of electrons to mass is negligible, almost all of an atom's mass is concentrated in its nucleus. Neutrons and protons each have a mass very close to one Dalton, so the mass number is close to, but slightly different from, the total mass of an atom, called its atomic mass. For example, the mass number of sodium is 23, but its atomic mass is 22.9898 Daltons, the difference is explained below. Mastering Biology Animation, Atomic Number and Atomic Mass Isotopes all atoms of a given element have the same number of protons, but some atoms have more neutrons than other atoms of the same element and therefore have greater mass. These different atomic forms of the same element are called Isotopes of the element As an example, the element carbon, which has the atomic number 6, has three naturally occurring isotopes. The most common isotope is carbon-12, which accounts for about 99% of the carbon in nature. The isotope has six neutrons. Most of the remaining 1% of carbon consists of atoms of the isotope, with 7 neutrons. A third, even rarer isotope, has 8 neutrons. Notice that all three isotopes of carbon have 6 protons, otherwise, they would not be carbon. Although the isotopes of an element have slightly different masses, they behave identically in chemical reactions. For an element with more than one naturally occurring isotope, the atomic mass is an average of those isotopes, weighted by their abundance. Thus, Carbon has an atomic mass of 12.01 Daltons. Both and are stable isotopes, meaning that their nuclei do not have a tendency to lose subatomic particles, a process called decay. 
The isotope, however, is unstable, or radioactive. A. Radioactive isotope is one in which the nucleus decays spontaneously, giving off particles and energy. When the radioactive decay leads to a change in the number of protons, it transforms the atom to an atom of a different element. For example, when a carbon-14 atom decays, a neutron decays into a proton, transforming the atom into a nitrogen atom. Radioactive isotopes have many useful applications in biology. Radioactive tracers Radioactive isotopes are often used as diagnostic tools in medicine. Cells can use radioactive atoms just as they would use non-radioactive isotopes of the same element. The radioactive isotopes are incorporated into biologically active molecules, which are then used as tracers to track atoms during metabolism, the chemical processes of an organism. For example, certain kidney disorders are diagnosed by injecting small doses of radioactively labeled substances into the blood and then analyzing the tracer molecules excreted in the urine. Radioactive tracers are also used in combination with sophisticated imaging instruments, such as PET scanners that can monitor growth and metabolism of cancers in the body. Figure 2.5 Figure 2.5 A PET scan, a medical use for radioactive isotopes. PET, an acronym for positron emission tomography, detects locations of intense chemical activity in the body. The bright yellow spot marks an area with an elevated level of radioactively labeled glucose, which in turn indicates high metabolic activity, a hallmark of cancerous tissue. Although radioactive isotopes are very useful in biological research and medicine, radiation from decaying isotopes also poses a hazard to life by damaging cellular molecules. The severity of this damage depends on the type and amount of radiation an organism absorbs. One of the most serious environmental threats is radioactive fallout from nuclear accidents. The doses of most isotopes used in medical diagnosis, however, are relatively safe. Radiometric Dating Evolution researchers measure radioactive decay in fossils to date these relics of past life. Fossils provide a large body of evidence for evolution, documenting differences between organisms from the past and those living at present and giving us insight into species that have disappeared over time. While the layering of fossil beds establishes that deeper fossils are older than more shallow ones, the actual age, in years, of the fossils in each layer cannot be determined by position alone. This is where radioactive isotopes come in. A parent isotope decays into its daughter isotope at a fixed rate, expressed as the half-life of the isotope the time it takes for 50% of the parent isotope to decay. Each radioactive isotope has a characteristic half-life that is not affected by temperature, pressure, or any other environmental variable. Using a process called radiometric dating, scientists measure the ratio of different isotopes and calculate how many half-lives, in years, have passed since an organism was fossilized or a rock was formed. Half-life values range from very short for some isotopes, measured in seconds or days, to extremely long uranium-238 has a half-life of 4.5 billion years. Each isotope can best measure a particular range of years, uranium-238 was used to determine that moon rocks are approximately 4.5 billion years old, similar to the estimated age of Earth. In the scientific skills exercise, you can work with data from an experiment that used carbon-14 to determine the age of an important fossil. Figure 25.6 explains more about radiometric dating of fossils. The energy levels of electrons. The simplified models of the atom in. Figure 2.4 greatly exaggerate the size of the nucleus relative to that of the whole atom. If an atom of helium were the size of a typical football stadium, the nucleus would be the size of a pencil eraser in the center of the field. Moreover, the electrons would be like two tiny gnats buzzing around the stadium. Atoms are mostly empty space. When two atoms approach each other during a chemical reaction, their nuclei do not come close enough to interact. Of the three subatomic particles we have discussed, only electrons are directly involved in chemical reactions. An atom's electrons vary in the amount of energy they possess. Energy is defined as the capacity to cause change for instance, by doing work. Potential energy is the energy that matter possesses because of its location or structure. For example, water in a reservoir on a hill has potential energy because of its altitude. When the gates of the reservoir's dam are opened and the water runs downhill, the energy can be used to do work, such as moving the blades of turbines to generate electricity. Because energy has been expended, the water has less energy at the bottom of the hill than it did in the reservoir. Matter has a natural tendency to move toward the lowest possible state of potential energy, in our example, the water runs downhill. To restore the potential energy of a reservoir, work must be done to elevate the water against gravity. The electrons of an atom have potential energy due to their distance from the nucleus. Figure 
the negatively charged electrons are attracted to the positively charged nucleus. It takes work to move a given electron farther away from the nucleus, so the more distant an electron is from the nucleus, the greater its potential energy. Unlike the continuous flow of water downhill, changes in the potential energy of electrons can occur only in steps of fixed amounts. An electron having a certain amount of energy is something like a ball on a staircase, see. Figure 2.6a. The ball can have different amounts of potential energy, depending on which step it is on, but it cannot spend much time between the steps. Similarly, an electron's potential energy is determined by its energy level. An electron can exist only at certain energy levels, not between them. Figure 2.6 Energy Levels of an Atom's Electrons Electrons exist only at fixed levels of potential energy called electron shells. Figure 2.6 Full Alternative Text Mastering Biology Figure Walkthrough Scientific Skills Exercise Calibrating a Standard Radioactive Isotope Decay Curve and Interpreting Data How long might Neanderthals have coexisted with modern humans, Homo sapiens? Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalensis, were living in Europe by 350,000 years ago and may have coexisted with early Homo sapiens in parts of Eurasia for hundreds or thousands of years before Neanderthals became extinct. Researchers sought to more accurately determine the extent of their overlap by pinning down the latest date Neanderthals still lived in the area. They used carbon-14 dating to determine the age of a Neanderthal fossil from the most recent, uppermost, archaeological layer containing Neanderthal bones. In this exercise you will calibrate a standard carbon-14 decay curve and use it to determine the age of this Neanderthal fossil. The age will help you approximate the last time the two species may have coexisted at the site where this fossil was collected. Neanderthal fossils How the experiment was done Carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope of carbon that decays to at a constant rate. Is present in the atmosphere in small amounts at a constant ratio with both and two other isotopes of carbon. When carbon is taken up from the atmosphere by a plant during photosynthesis, and isotopes are incorporated into the plant in the same proportions in which they were present in the atmosphere. These proportions remain the same in the tissues of an animal that eats the plant. While an organism is alive, the in its body constantly decays to but is constantly replaced by new carbon from the environment. Once an organism dies, it stops taking in new but the in its tissues continues to decay, while the in its tissues remains the same because it is not radioactive and does not decay. Thus, Scientists can calculate how long the pool of original has been decaying in a fossil by measuring the ratio of 2 and comparing it to the ratio of 2 present originally in the atmosphere. The fraction of in a fossil compared to the original fraction of can be converted to years because we know that the half-life of is 5730 years in other words, half of the in a fossil decays every 5730 years. Data from the experiment The researchers found that the Neanderthal fossil had approximately 0.0078, or, in scientific notation, as much as the atmosphere. The following questions will guide you through translating this fraction into the age of the fossil. Data from our Pinhasi ETAL, revised age of late Neanderthal occupation and the end of the Middle Paleolithic in the Northern Caucasus, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences USA 147 colon 8611, 8616, 2011. DOI 101073 slash 2227 full alternative text. Interpret the data. The graph shows a standard curve of radioactive isotope decay. The line shows the fraction of the radioactive isotope over time, before the present, in units of half-lives. Recall that a half-life is the amount of time it takes for half of the radioactive isotope to decay. Labeling each data point with the corresponding fractions will help orient you to this graph. Draw an arrow to the data point for and write the fraction of that will remain after one half-life. Calculate the fraction of remaining at each half-life and write the fractions on the graph near arrows pointing to the data points. Convert each fraction to a decimal number and round off to a maximum of three significant digits, zeros at the beginning of the number do not count as significant digits. Also write each decimal number in scientific notation. Recall that has a half-life of 5730 years. To calibrate the x-axis for decay, write the time before present in years below each half-life. The researchers found that the Neanderthal fossil had approximately 0.0078 as much as found originally in the atmosphere. A. Using the numbers on your graph, determine how many half-lives have passed since the Neanderthal died. B. Using your calibration on the x-axis, what is the approximate age of the Neanderthal fossil in years, round off to the nearest thousand. C. Approximately when did Neanderthals become extinct according to the study? D. The researchers cite evidence that modern humans, H. sapiens, 
became established in the same region as the last Neanderthals approximately 39,000 to 42,000 years ago. What does this suggest about possible overlap of Neanderthals and modern humans? Carbon-14 dating works for fossils up to about 75,000 years old, fossils older than that contain too little to be detected. Most dinosaurs went extinct 65.5 million years ago. A. Can be used to date dinosaur bones. Explain. B. Radioactive uranium-235 has a half-life of 704 million years. If it was incorporated into dinosaur bones, could it be used to date the di- A version of the scientific skills exercise can be assigned in mastering biology. An electron's energy level is correlated with its average distance from the nucleus. Electrons are found in different electron shells, each with a characteristic average distance and energy level. In diagrams, shells can be represented by concentric circles, as they are in Figure 2.6b. The first shell is closest to the nucleus, and electrons in this shell have the lowest potential energy. Electrons in the second shell have more energy, and electrons in the third shell even more energy. An electron can move from one shell to another, but only by absorbing or losing an amount of energy equal to the difference in potential energy between its position in the old shell and that in the new shell. When an electron absorbs energy, it moves to a shell farther out from the nucleus. For example, light energy can excite an electron to a higher energy level. Indeed, this is the first step taken when plants harness the energy of sunlight for photosynthesis, the process that produces food from carbon dioxide and water. When an electron loses energy, it falls back to a shell closer to the nucleus, and the lost energy is usually released to the environment as visible light or ultraviolet radiation. Electron Distribution and Chemical Properties The chemical behavior of an atom is determined by the distribution of electrons in the atom's electron shells. Beginning with hydrogen, the simplest atom, we can imagine building the atoms of the other elements by adding one proton and one electron at a time, along with an appropriate number of neutrons. Figure 2.7, a modified version of what is called the periodic table of the elements, shows this distribution of electrons for the first 18 elements, from hydrogen to argon. The elements are arranged in three rows, or periods, corresponding to the number of electron shells in their atoms. The left-to-right sequence of elements in each row corresponds to the sequential addition of electrons and protons. See the complete periodic table. Figure 2.7 Electron Distribution Diagrams for the first 18 elements in the periodic table. In a standard periodic table, information for each element is presented as shown for helium in the inset. In the diagrams in this table, electrons are represented as yellow dots and electron shells as concentric circles. These diagrams are a convenient way to picture the distribution of an atom's electrons among its electron shells, but these simplified models do not accurately represent the shape of the atom or the location of its electrons. The elements are arranged in rows, each representing the filling of an electron shell. As electrons are added, they occupy the lowest available shell. Figure 2.7 Full Alternative Text Visual Skills What is the atomic number of magnesium? How many protons and electrons does it have? How many electron shells? How many valence electrons? Mastering Biology Animation, Electron Distribution Diagrams Hydrogen's one electron and helium's two electrons are located in the first shell. Electrons, like all matter, tend to exist in the lowest available state of potential energy. In an atom, this state is in the first shell. However, the first shell can hold no more than two electrons, thus, hydrogen and helium are the only elements in the first row of the table. In an atom with more than two electrons, the additional electrons must occupy higher shells because the first shell is full. The next element, lithium, has three electrons. Two of these electrons fill the first shell, while the third electron occupies the second shell. The second shell holds a maximum of eight electrons. Neon, at the end of the second row, has eight electrons in the second shell, giving it a total of ten electrons. The chemical behavior of an atom depends mostly on the number of electrons in its outermost shell. We call those outer electrons. Valence electrons and the outermost electron shell the valence shell. In the case of lithium, there is only one valence electron, and the second shell is the valence shell. Atoms with the same number of electrons in their valence shells exhibit similar chemical behavior. For example, fluorine, F, and chlorine, Cl, both have seven valence electrons, and both form compounds when combined with the element sodium, Na sodium fluoride, NaF, is commonly added to toothpaste to prevent tooth decay, and, as described earlier, NaCl is table salt, C. Figure 2.2. An atom with a completed valence shell is unreactive, that is, it will not interact readily with other atoms. 
at the far right of the periodic table are helium, neon, and argon, the only three elements shown in figure 2.7 that have full valence shells. These elements are said to be inert, meaning chemically unreactive. All the other atoms in figure 2.7 are chemically reactive because they have incomplete valence shells. Electron orbitals In the early 1900s, the electron shells of an atom were visualized as concentric paths of electrons orbiting the nucleus, some would like planets orbiting the sun. It is still convenient to use two-dimensional concentric circle diagrams, as in figure 2.7, to symbolize three-dimensional electron shells. However, you need to remember that each concentric circle represents only the average distance between an electron in that shell and the nucleus. Accordingly, the concentric circle diagrams do not give a real picture of an atom. In reality, we can never know the exact location of an electron. What we can do instead is describe the space in which an electron spends most of its time. The three-dimensional space where an electron is found 90% of the time is called an orbital. Each electron shell contains electrons at a particular energy level, distributed among a specific number of orbitals of distinctive shapes and orientations. Figure 2.8 shows the orbitals of neon as an example, with its electron distribution diagram for reference. You can think of an orbital as a component of an electron shell. The first electron shell has only one spherical s orbital, called 1s, but the second shell has four orbitals, one large spherical s orbital, called 2s, and three dumbbell-shaped p orbitals, called 2p orbitals. The third shell and other higher electron shells also have s and p orbitals, as well as orbitals of more complex shapes. Figure 2.8 Electron Orbitals Figure 2.8 Full Alternative Text No more than two electrons can occupy a single orbital. The first electron shell can therefore accommodate up to two electrons in its s orbital. The lone electron of a hydrogen atom occupies the one's orbital, as do the two electrons of a helium atom. The four orbitals of the second electron shell can hold up to eight electrons, two in each orbital. Electrons in each of the four orbitals in the second shell have nearly the same energy, but they move in different volumes of space. The reactivity of an atom arises from the presence of unpaired electrons in one or more orbitals of the atom's valence shell. As you will see in the next section, atoms interact in a way that completes their valence shells. When they do so, it is the unpaired electrons that are involved. Concept Check 2.2 a lithium atom has three protons and four neutrons. What is its mass number? A nitrogen atom has seven protons, and the most common isotope of nitrogen has seven neutrons. A radioactive isotope of nitrogen has eight neutrons. Write the atomic number and mass number of this radioactive nitrogen as a chemical symbol with a subscript and superscript. How many electrons does fluorine have? How many electron shells? Name the orbitals that are occupied. How many electrons are needed to fill the valence shell? Visual skills in Figure 2.7 If two or more elements are in the Concept 2.3 The formation and function of molecules and ionic compounds depend on chemical bonding between atoms. Now that we have looked at the structure of atoms, we can move up the hierarchy of organization and see how atoms combine to form molecules and ionic compounds. Atoms with incomplete valence shells can interact with certain other atoms in such a way that each partner atom completes its valence shell, the atoms either share or transfer valence electrons. These interactions usually result in atoms staying close together, held by attractions called chemical bonds. The strongest kinds of chemical bonds are covalent bonds in molecules and ionic bonds in dry ionic compounds. Ionic bonds in aqueous, or water-based, solutions are weak interactions, as we will see later. Mastering Biology Animation, Introduction to Chemical Bonds Covalent Bonds A. Covalent bond is the sharing of a pair of valence electrons by two atoms. For example, let's consider what happened. Figure 2.9 Each hydrogen atom is now associated with two electrons in what amounts to a completed valence shell. Two or more atoms held together by covalent bonds constitute a molecule, in this case a hydrogen molecule. Figure 2.9 Formation of a Covalent Bond Figure 2.9 Full Alternative Text Figure 2.10 shows several ways of representing a hydrogen molecule. Its molecular formula, H2, simply indicates that the molecule consists of two atoms of hydrogen. Electron sharing can be depicted by an electron distribution diagram or by a Lewis dot structure, in which element symbols are surrounded by dots that represent the valence electrons, HH. 
We can also use a structural formula, HH, where the line represents a single bond, a pair of shared electrons. A space filling model comes closest to representing the actual shape of the molecule. You may also be familiar with ball and stick models, which are shown in Figure 2.15 Figure 2.10 Covalent bonding in four molecules The number of electrons required to complete an atom's valence shell generally determines how many covalent bonds that atom will form. This figure shows several ways of indicating covalent bonds. Figure 2.10 Full alternative text Mastering biology Animation, covalent bonds Oxygen has six electrons in its second electron shell and therefore needs two more electrons to complete its valence shell. Two oxygen atoms form a molecule by sharing two pairs of valence electrons. Figure 2.10b The atoms are thus joined by what is called a double bond, OO. Each atom that can share valence electrons has a bonding capacity corresponding to the number of covalent bonds the atom can form. When the bonds form, they give the atom a full complement of electrons in the valence shell. The bonding capacity of oxygen, for example, is 2. This bonding capacity is called the atoms. Valence n usually equals the number of electrons required to complete the atom's outermost, valence, shell. See if you can determine the valences of hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon by studying the electron distribution diagrams in Figure 2.7 You can see that the valence of hydrogen is 1, oxygen, 2, nitrogen, 3, and carbon, 4. The situation is more complicated for phosphorus, in the third row of the periodic table, which can have a valence of 3 or 5 depending on the combination of single and double bonds it makes. The molecules H2 and O2 are pure elements rather than compounds because a compound is a combination of two or more different elements. Water, with the molecular formula H2O, is a compound. Two atoms of hydrogen are needed to satisfy the valence of one oxygen atom. Figure 2.10c shows the structure of a water molecule. Water is so important to life that Chapter 3 is devoted to its structure and behavior. Methane, the main component of natural gas, is a compound with the molecular formula CH4. It takes four hydrogen atoms, each with a valence of one, to complete the valence shell of a carbon atom, with its valence of four. Figure 2.10d We'll look at other carbon compounds in Chapter 4 Atoms in a molecule attract shared bonding electrons to varying degrees, depending on the element. The attraction of a particular atom for the electrons of a covalent bond is called its Electronegativity The more electronegative an atom is, the more strongly it pulls shared electrons toward itself. In a covalent bond between two atoms of the same element, the electrons are shared equally because the two atoms have the same electronegativity the tug of war is at a standoff. Such a bond is called a Nonpolar covalent bond for example, the single bond of H2 is nonpolar, as is the double bond of O2. However, when an atom is bonded to a more electronegative atom, the electrons of the bond are not shared equally. This type of bond is called a polar covalent bond. Such bonds vary in their polarity, depending on the relative electronegativity of the two atoms. For example, the bonds between the oxygen and hydrogen atoms of a water molecule are quite polar. Figure 2.11 Figure 2.11 Polar covalent bonds in a water molecule Figure 2.11 Full alternative text Mastering biology Animation, nonpolar and polar molecules Oxygen is one of the most electronegative elements, attracting shared electrons much more strongly than hydrogen does. In a covalent bond between oxygen and hydrogen, the electrons spend more time near the oxygen nucleus than near the hydrogen nucleus. Because electrons have a negative charge and are pulled toward oxygen in a water molecule, the oxygen atom has partial negative charges, indicated by the Greek letter delta with a minus sign, delta comma, or delta minus, and the hydrogen atoms have partial positive charges, delta plus comma, or delta plus. In contrast, the individual bonds of methane, CH4, are much less polar because the electronegativities of carbon and hydrogen are quite similar. Ionic bonds In some cases, Two atoms are so unequal in their attraction for valence electrons that the more electronegative atom strips an electron completely away from its partner. The two resulting oppositely charged atoms, or molecules, are called ions. A positively charged ion is called a cation, while a negatively charged ion is called an anion. 
it may help you to think of the T in cation as a plus sign, and of anion as a negative ion. Because of their opposite charges, cations and anions attract each other, this attraction is called an ionic bond. Note that the transfer of an electron is not, by itself, the formation of a bond, rather, it allows a bond to form because it results in two ions of opposite charge. Any two ions of opposite charge can form an ionic bond. The ions do not need to have acquired their charge by an electron transfer with each other. This is what happens when an atom of sodium, 11Na, encounters an atom of chlorine, 17C1. Figure 2.12 A sodium atom has a total of 11 electrons, with its single valence electron in the third electron shell. A chlorine atom has a total of 17 electrons, with 7 electrons in its valence shell. When these two atoms meet, the lone valence electron of sodium is transferred to the chlorine atom, and both atoms end up with their valence shells complete. Because sodium no longer has an electron in the third shell, the second shell is now the valence shell. The electron transfer between the two atoms moves one unit of negative charge from sodium to chlorine. Sodium, now with 11 protons but only 10 electrons, has a net electrical charge of 1 plus, the sodium atom has become a cation. Conversely, the chlorine atom, having gained an extra electron, now has 17 protons and 18 electrons, giving it a net electrical charge of 1, it has become a chloride ion and anion. Figure 2.12 Electron Transfer and Ionic Bonding The attraction between oppositely charged atoms, or ions, is an ionic bond. An ionic bond can form between any two oppositely charged ions, even if they have not been formed by transfer of an electron from one to the other. Figure 2.12 Full Alternative Text Mastering Biology Animation, Formation of Ions and Ionic Bonds Compounds formed by ionic bonds are called Ionic compounds, or Salts We know the ionic compound sodium chloride, NaCl, as table salt. Figure 2.13 Salts are often found in nature as crystals of various sizes and shapes. Each salt crystal is an aggregate of vast numbers of cations and anions bonded by their electrical attraction and arranged in a three-dimensional lattice. Unlike a covalent compound, which consists of molecules having a definite size and number of atoms, an ionic compound does not consist of molecules. The formula for an ionic compound, such as NaCl, indicates only the ratio of elements in a crystal of the salt. NaCl by itself is not a molecule. Figure 2.13 A sodium chloride, NaCl, crystal. The sodium ions, Na+, and chloride ions, Cl, are held together by ionic bonds. The formula NaCl tells us that the ratio of Na plus to Cl is 1 colon 1. Not all salts have equal numbers of cations and anions. For example, the ionic compound magnesium chloride, MgCl2, has two chloride ions for each magnesium ion. Magnesium, 12 mg, must lose two outer electrons if the atom is to have a complete valence shell, so it has a tendency to become a cation with a net charge of 2 plus, Mg2 plus. One magnesium cation can therefore form ionic bonds with two chloride anions, Cl. The term ion also applies to entire molecules that are electrically charged. In the salt ammonium chloride, NH4Cl, for instance, the anion is a single chloride ion, Cl, but the cation is ammonium, NH4+, a nitrogen atom covalently bonded to four hydrogen atoms. The whole ammonium ion has an electrical charge of 1 plus because it has given up one electron and thus is one electron short. Environment affects the strength of ionic bonds. In a dry salt crystal, the bonds are so strong that it takes a hammer and chisel to break enough of them to crack the crystal in two. If the same salt crystal is dissolved in water, however, the ionic bonds are much weaker because each ion is partially shielded by its interactions with water molecules. Most drugs are manufactured as salts because they are quite stable when dry but can dissociate, come apart, easily in water. In Concept 3.2, you will learn how water dissolves salts. Weak Chemical Interactions In organisms, most of the strongest chemical bonds are covalent bonds, which link atoms to form a cell's molecules. But weaker interactions within and between molecules are also indispensable, contributing greatly to the emergent properties of life. Many large biological molecules are held in their functional form by weak interactions. In addition, when two molecules in the cell make contact, they may adhere temporarily by weak interactions. The reversibility of weak interactions can be an advantage, two molecules can come together, affect one another in some way, and then separate. Several types of weak chemical interactions are important in organisms. One is the ionic bond as it exists between ions dissociated in water, 
which we just discussed. Hydrogen bonds and van der Waals interactions are also crucial to life. Hydrogen bonds Among weak chemical interactions, hydrogen bonds are so central to the chemistry of life that they deserve special attention. When a hydrogen atom is covalently bonded to an electronegative atom, the hydrogen atom has a partial positive charge that allows it to be attracted to a different electronegative atom with a partial negative charge nearby. This non-covalent attraction between a hydrogen and an electronegative atom is called a hydrogen bond. In living cells, the electronegative partners are usually oxygen or nitrogen atoms. Figure 2.14 shows hydrogen bonding between water, H2O, and ammonia, NH3. Figure 2.14 A hydrogen bond. Figure 2.14 Full alternative text. Draw IT draw one water molecule hydrogen bonded to four other water molecules around it. Use simple outlines of space filling models. Draw the partial charges on the water molecules and use dots for the hydrogen bonds. Mastering biology. Animation, hydrogen bonds. Van der Waals interactions. Even a molecule with nonpolar covalent bonds may have positively and negatively charged regions. Electrons are not always evenly distributed, at any instant, they may accumulate by chance in one part of a molecule or another. The results are ever-changing regions of positive and negative charge that enable all atoms and molecules to stick to one another. These Van der Waals interactions are individually weak and occur only when atoms and molecules are very close together. When many such interactions occur simultaneously, however, they can be powerful, Van der Waals interactions allow the gecko lizard shown here to walk straight up a wall. The anatomy of the gecko's foot including toes with hundreds of thousands of tiny hairs, each with multiple projections maximizes surface contact with the wall. The van der Waals interactions between the foot molecules and the molecules of the wall surface are so numerous that despite their individual weakness, together they can support the gecko's body weight. Van der Waals interactions, hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds in water, and other weak interactions may form not only between molecules but also between parts of a large molecule, such as a protein or nucleic acid. The cumulative effect of weak interactions is to reinforce the three-dimensional shape of the molecule. You will learn more about the very important biological roles of weak interactions in Figures 5.18 and 5.24 Molecular Shape and Function A molecule has a characteristic size and shape, which are key to its function in the living cell. A molecule consisting of two atoms, such as H2 or O2, is always linear, but most molecules with more than two atoms have more complicated shapes. These shapes are determined by the positions of the atom's orbitals. Figure 2.15 When an atom forms covalent bonds, the orbitals in its valence shell undergo rearrangement. For atoms with valence electrons in both S and P orbitals, review. Figure 2.8, the single S and 3P orbitals form four new hybrid orbitals shaped like identical teardrops extending from the region of the atomic nucleus, as shown in. Figure 2.15a. If we connect the larger ends of the teardrops with lines, we have the outline of a geometric shape called a tetrahedron, a pyramid with a triangular base. Figure 2.15 Molecular Shapes Due to Hybrid Orbitals Figure 2.15 Full Alternative Text For water molecules, H2O, two of the hybrid orbitals in the oxygen's valence shell are shared with hydrogens. The other two hybrid orbitals are occupied by lone, unbonded, pairs of electrons, C. Figure 2.15b The result is a molecule shaped roughly like AV, with its two covalent bonds at an angle of 104.5 degrees. The methane molecule, CH4, has the shape of a completed tetrahedron because all four hybrid orbitals of the carbon atom are shared with hydrogen atoms, C. Figure 2.15b. The carbon nucleus is at the center, with its four covalent bonds radiating to hydrogen nuclei at the corners of the tetrahedron. Larger molecules containing multiple carbon atoms, including many of the molecules that make up living matter, have more complex overall shapes. However, the tetrahedral shape of a carbon atom bonded to four other atoms is often a repeating motif within such molecules. Molecular shape is crucial, it determines how biological molecules recognize and respond to one another with specificity. Biological molecules often bind temporarily to each other by forming weak interactions, but only if their shapes are complementary. Consider the effects of opiates, drugs such as morphine and heroin derived from opium. Opiates relieve pain and alter mood by weakly binding to specific receptor molecules on the surfaces of brain cells. Why would brain cells carry receptors for opiates, compounds that are not endogenous, made by the body? In 1975, 
this question was answered by the discovery of endorphins, or endogenous morphines. Endorphins are signaling molecules made by the pituitary gland that bind to the receptors, relieving pain and producing euphoria during times of stress, such as intense exercise. Opiates have shapes similar to endorphins and can bind to endorphin receptors in the brain. That is why opiates and endorphins have similar effects. Figure 2.16 The role of molecular shape in brain chemistry illustrates how biological organization leads to a match between structure and function, one of biology's unifying themes. Figure 2.16 A molecular mimic Morphine affects pain perception and emotional state by mimicking the brain's natural endorphins. Figure 2.16 Full alternative text Mastering biology Interview with Candice Pert, Discovering Opiate Receptors in the Brain Concept Check 2.3 Why does the structure HCCH fail to make sense chemically? What holds the atoms together in a crystal of magnesium chloride, MgCl2? What if? If you were a pharmaceutical researcher, why would you want to learn the three-dimensional shapes of naturally occurring signaling molecules? Concept 2.4 Chemical reactions make and break chemical bonds The making and breaking of chemical bonds, leading to changes in the composition of matter, are called Chemical reactions An example is the reaction between hydrogen and oxygen molecules that forms water. This reaction breaks the covalent bonds of H2 and O2 and forms the new bonds of H2O. When we write the equation for a chemical reaction, we use an arrow to indicate the conversion of the starting materials, called the reactants, to the resulting materials, or products. The coefficients indicate the number of molecules involved, for example, the coefficient 2 before the H2 means that the reaction starts with two molecules of hydrogen. Notice that all atoms of the reactants must be accounted for in the products. Matter is conserved in a chemical reaction, reactions cannot create or destroy atoms but can only rearrange, redistribute, the electrons among them. Photosynthesis, which takes place within the cells of green plant tissues, is an important biological example of how chemical reactions rearrange matter. Humans and other animals ultimately depend on photosynthesis for food and oxygen, and this process is at the foundation of life in almost all ecosystems. The following summarizes photosynthesis. The raw materials of photosynthesis are carbon dioxide and water, which land plants absorb from the air and soil, respectively. Within the plant cells, sunlight powers the conversion of these ingredients to a sugar called glucose and oxygen molecules, a byproduct that can be seen when released by a water plant. Figure 2.17 Although photosynthesis is actually a sequence of many chemical reactions, we still end up with the same number and types of atoms that we had when we started. Matter has simply been rearranged, with an input of energy provided by sunlight. Figure 2.17 Photosynthesis, a solar-powered rearrangement of matter. Elodia, a freshwater plant, produces sugar by rearranging the atoms of carbon dioxide and water in the chemical process known as photosynthesis, which is powered by sunlight. Much of the sugar is then converted to other food molecules. Oxygen gas is a byproduct of photosynthesis, notice the bubbles of gas escaping from the leaves submerged in water. Draw IT ad labels and arrows on the photo showing the reactants and products of photosynthesis as it takes place in a leaf. All chemical reactions are theoretically reversible, with the products of the forward reaction becoming the reactants for the reverse reaction. For example, hydrogen and nitrogen molecules can combine to form ammonia, but ammonia can also decompose to regenerate hydrogen and nitrogen. The two opposite headed arrows indicate that the reaction is reversible. One of the factors affecting the rate of a reaction is the concentration of reactants. The greater the concentration of reactant molecules, the more frequently they collide with one another and have an opportunity to react and form products. The same holds true for products. As products accumulate, collisions resulting in the reverse reaction become more frequent. Eventually, the forward and reverse reactions occur at the same rate, and the relative concentrations of products and reactants stop changing. The point at which the reactions offset one another exactly is called chemical equilibrium. This is a dynamic equilibrium, Reactions are still going on in both directions, but with no net effect on the concentrations of reactants and products. Equilibrium does not mean that the reactants and products are equal in concentration, but only that their concentrations have stabilized at a particular ratio. 
the reaction involving ammonia reaches equilibrium when ammonia decomposes as rapidly as it forms. In some chemical reactions, the equilibrium point may lie so far to the right that these reactions go essentially to completion, that is, virtually all the reactants are converted to products. We will return to the subject of chemical reactions after more detailed study of the various types of molecules that are important to life. In the next chapter, we focus on water, the substance in which all the chemical processes of organisms occur. Concept Check 2.4 Make connections Consider the reaction between hydrogen and oxygen that forms water, shown with ball and stick models at the beginning of Concept 2.4 After studying Figure 2.10 Draw and label the Lewis dot structures representing this reaction. Which type of chemical reaction, if any, occurs faster at equilibrium, the formation of products from reactants or that of reactants from products? What if? Write an equation that uses the products of photosynthesis as reactants and the reactants of photosynthesis as products. Add energy as another product. This new equation describes a process that occurs in your cells. Describe this equation in words. How does this equation relate to breathing? For suggested answers, see Appendix A Summary of Key Concepts Go to Mastering Biology for Assignments, the e-text, the study area, and dynamic study modules. To review key terms, go to the vocabulary self-quiz in the Mastering Biology e-text or study area, or go to goo.gl slash zkjz90. Concept 2.1 Matter consists of chemical elements in pure form and in combinations called compounds, pp. 29. 30. Elements cannot be broken down chemically to other substances. A compound contains two or more different elements in a fixed ratio. Oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen make up approximately 96% of living matter. Compare an element and a compound. Concept 2.2 An element's properties depend on the structure of its atoms, pp. 30. 36. An atom, the smallest unit of an element, has the following components. 2.2 to 13 Full alternative text. An electrically neutral atom has equal numbers of electrons and protons, the number of protons determines the atomic number. The atomic mass is measured in Daltons and is roughly equal to the mass number, the sum of protons plus neutrons. Isotopes of an element differ from each other in neutron number and therefore mass. Unstable isotopes give off particles and energy as radioactivity. In an atom, electrons occupy specific electron shells, the electrons in a shell have a characteristic energy level. Electron distribution in shells determines the chemical behavior of an atom. An atom that has an incomplete outer shell, the valence shell, is reactive. Electrons exist in orbitals, three-dimensional spaces with specific shapes that are components of electron shells. Draw IT Draw the electron distribution diagrams for neon and argon. Use these diagrams to explain why these elements are chemically unreactive. Concept 2.3 The formation and function of molecules and ionic compounds depend on chemical bonding between atoms, pp. 36. 40. Chemical bonds form when atoms interact and complete their valence shells. Covalent bonds form when pairs of electrons are shared. 2.2 to 14 Full alternative text. Molecules consist of two or more covalently bonded atoms. The attraction of an atom for the electrons of a covalent bond is its electronegativity. If both atoms are the same, they have the same electronegativity and share a nonpolar covalent bond. Electrons of a polar covalent bond are pulled closer to the more electronegative atom, such as the oxygen in. An ion forms when an atom or molecule gains or loses an electron and becomes charged. An ionic bond is the attraction between two oppositely charged ions. 2.2-15 Full Alternative Text Weak interactions reinforce the shapes of large molecules and help molecules adhere to each other. A hydrogen bond is an attraction between a hydrogen atom carrying a partial positive charge and an electronegative atom carrying a partial negative charge. Van der Waals interactions occur between transiently positive and negative regions of molecules. A molecule's shape is determined by the positions of its atom's valence orbitals. Covalent bonds result in hybrid orbitals, which are responsible for the shapes of, and many more complex biological molecules. 
molecular shape is usually the basis for the recognition of one biological molecule by another. In terms of electron sharing between atoms, compare nonpolar covalent bonds, polar covalent bonds, and the formation of ions. Concept 2.4 Chemical reactions make and break chemical bonds, pp. 40. 41. Chemical reactions change reactants into products while conserving matter. All chemical reactions are theoretically reversible. Chemical equilibrium is reached when the forward and reverse reaction rates are equal. Test your understanding. For more multiple choice questions, go to the practice test in the Mastering Biology e-text or study area, or go to goo.gl slash gruwrg Levels 1 to 2, Remembering slash Understanding Compared with 31p The radioactive isotope 32p Has A different atomic number One more proton One more electron One more neutron in the term trace element, the adjective trace means that the element is required in very small amounts. The element can be used as a label to trace atoms through an organism's metabolism. The element is very rare on Earth. The element enhances health but is not essential for the organism's long-term survival. The reactivity of an atom arises from the average distance of the outermost electron shell from the nucleus. The existence of unpaired electrons in the valence shell. The sum of the potential energies of all the electron shells. The potential energy of the valence shell. Which statement is true of all atoms that are anions? The atom has more electrons than protons. The atom has more protons than electrons. The atom has fewer protons than does a neutral atom of the same element. The atom has more neutrons than protons. Which of the following statements correctly describes any chemical reaction that has reached equilibrium? The concentrations of products and reactants are equal. The reaction is now irreversible. Both forward and reverse reactions have halted. The rates of the forward and reverse reactions are equal. Levels 3 to 4, applying slash analyzing. We can represent atoms by listing the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons for example, for helium. Which of the following represents the isotope of oxygen? The atomic number of sulfur is 16. Sulfur combines with hydrogen by covalent bonding to form a compound, hydrogen sulfide. Based on the number of valence electrons in a sulfur atom, predict the molecular formula of the compound. HS What coefficients must be placed in the following blanks so that all atoms are accounted for in the products? 2, 1 3, 1, 1, 3, 2, 2. Draw IT draw Lewis dot structures for each hypothetical molecule shown below, using the correct number of valence electrons for each atom. Determine which molecule makes sense because each atom has a complete valence shell and each bond has the correct number of electrons. Explain what makes the other molecule nonsensical, considering the number of bonds each type of atom can make. 2.3 to 16 full alternative text. Levels 5 to 6, Evaluating slash Creating Evolution connection the percentages of naturally occurring elements making up the human body, c. Table 2.1, are similar to the percentages of these elements found in other organisms. How could you account for the similarity among organisms? Scientific inquiry female luna moths, Actius luna, attract males by emitting chemical signals that spread through the air. A male hundreds of meters away can detect these molecules and fly toward their source. The sensory organs responsible for this behavior are the comb-like antennae visible in the photograph shown here. Each filament of an antenna is equipped with thousands of receptor cells that detect the sex attractant. Based on what you learned in this chapter, propose a hypothesis to account for the ability of the male moth to detect a specific molecule in the presence of many other molecules in the air. What predictions does your hypothesis make? Design an experiment to test one of these predictions. Write about a theme, organization while waiting at an airport, Neil Campbell once overheard this claim, it's paranoid and ignorant to worry about industry or agriculture contaminating the environment with their chemical wastes. After all, this stuff is just made of the same atoms that were already present in our environment. 
drawing on your knowledge of electron distribution, bonding, and emergent properties, c. Concept 1.1, write a short essay, 100 to 150 words, countering this argument. Synthesize your knowledge. This bombardier beetle is spraying a boiling hot liquid that contains irritating chemicals, used as a defense mechanism against its enemies. The beetle stores two sets of chemicals separately in its glands. Using what you learned about chemistry in this chapter, propose a possible explanation for why the beetle is not harmed by the chemicals it stores and what causes the explosive discharge. For selected answers, see Appendix A Three Water and Life Figure 3.1 Ringed seals, Foca hispida, depend on Arctic sea ice as a platform from which to hunt for fish in the water below. As Earth warms from climate change, the melting of sea ice is a threat to species that live on, under, and around the floating ice. 3.1 to 1 Full Alternative Text Key Concepts Concepts 3.1 Polar covalent bonds in water molecules result in hydrogen bonding. 45. 3.24 Emergent properties of water contribute to Earth's suitability for life up. 45. 3.3 Acidic and basic conditions affect living organisms. 51. Study tip. Make a visual study guide, draw a diagram and write a caption that explains how the structure of water supports life for each of the following properties of water. Go to Mastering Biology. For students, in e-text and study area. Get ready for Chapter 3 Bioflix Registered Animation, Adhesion and Cohesion in Plants Animation, Acids, Bases, and pH For instructors to assign, in item library Chemistry Review, Atoms and Molecules, Polar Attractions Chemistry Review, Water, Properties of Water Concept 3.1 Polar covalent bonds in water molecules result in hydrogen bonding. Water is so familiar to us that it is easy to overlook its many extraordinary qualities. Following the theme of emergent properties, we can trace water's unique behavior to the structure and interactions of its molecules. Studied on its own, the water molecule is deceptively simple. It is shaped like a wide V, with its two hydrogen atoms joined to the oxygen atom by single covalent bonds. Oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen, so the electrons of the covalent bonds spend more time closer to oxygen than to hydrogen, these are Polar covalent bonds, c. Figure 2.11 This unequal sharing of electrons and water's V-like shape make it a Polar molecule, meaning that its overall charge is unevenly distributed. In water, the oxygen of the molecule has partial negative charges Delta And the hydrogens have partial positive charges Delta plus. The properties of water arise from attractions between oppositely charged atoms of different water molecules, the partially positive hydrogen of one molecule is attracted to the partially negative oxygen of a nearby molecule. The two molecules are thus held together by a hydrogen bond. Figure 3.2. When water is in its liquid form, its hydrogen bonds are very fragile, each only about 1 20th as strong as a covalent bond. The hydrogen bonds form, break, and reform with great frequency. Each lasts only a few trillionths of a second, but the molecules are constantly forming new hydrogen bonds with a succession of partners. Therefore, at any instant, most of the water molecules are hydrogen bonded to their neighbors. The extraordinary properties of water emerge from this hydrogen bonding, which organizes water molecules into a higher level of structural order. Figure 3.2 Hydrogen Bonds Between Water Molecules Figure 3.2 Full Alternative Text Draw IT draw partial charges on the water molecule at the far left, and draw three more water molecules hydrogen bonded to it. Mastering Biology Animation, Polarity of Water Concept Check 3.1 Make connections what is electronegativity, 
and how does it affect interactions between water molecules? Review Figure 2.11 Visual skills look at Figure 3.2 and explain why the central water molecule can hydrogen bond to other water molecules. Why is it unlikely that two neighboring water molecules would be arranged like this? What if? What would be the effect on the properties of the water molecule if oxygen and hydrogen had equal electronegativity? For suggested answers, see Appendix A Concept 3.24 Emergent properties of water contribute to Earth's suitability for life. We will examine four emergent properties of water that contribute to Earth's suitability as an environment for life, cohesive behavior, ability to moderate temperature, expansion upon freezing, and versatility as a solvent. Cohesion of water molecules Water molecules stay close to each other as a result of hydrogen bonding. Although the arrangement of molecules in a sample of liquid water is constantly changing, at any given moment many of the molecules are linked by multiple hydrogen bonds. These linkages make water more structured than most other liquids. Collectively, the hydrogen bonds hold the substance together, a phenomenon called Cohesion One result of cohesion due to hydrogen bonding is high Surface tension, a measure of how difficult it is to stretch or break the surface of a liquid. At the air-water interface is an ordered arrangement of water molecules, hydrogen bonded to one another and to the water below, but not to the air above. This asymmetry gives water an unusually high surface tension, making it behave as though it were coated with an invisible film. The spider in Figure 3.3 takes advantage of the surface tension of water to walk across a pond without breaking the surface, and some plants can float on water as well. You can observe the surface tension of water by slightly overfilling a drinking glass, the water will stand above the rim. Figure 3.3 Walking on Water The high surface tension of water, resulting from the collective strength of its hydrogen bonds, allows this raft spider to walk on the surface of a pond. Cohesion also contributes to the transport of water and dissolved nutrients against gravity in plants. Figure 3.4 Water from the roots reaches the leaves through a network of water-conducting cells. As water evaporates from a leaf, hydrogen bonds cause water molecules leaving the veins to tug on molecules farther down, and the upward pull is transmitted through the water-conducting cells all the way to the roots. Adhesion, the clinging of one substance to another, also plays a role. Adhesion of water by hydrogen bonds to the molecules of cell walls helps counter the downward pull of gravity, see. Figure 3.4 Figure 3.4 Water Transport in Plants Evaporation from leaves pulls water upward from the roots through water-conducting cells. Because of the properties of cohesion and adhesion, the tallest trees can transport water more than 100 m upward approximately one quarter the height of the Empire State Building in New York City. Figure 3.4 Full Alternative Text Mastering Biology Bioflix Registered Animation, Adhesion and Cohesion in Plants Animation, Cohesion of Water Moderation of Temperature by Water Water moderates air temperature by absorbing heat from air that is warmer and releasing stored heat to air that is cooler. Water is effective as a heat bank because it can absorb or release a relatively large amount of heat with only a slight change in its own temperature. To understand this capability of water, let's first look at temperature and heat. Temperature and heat Anything that moves has Kinetic energy, the energy of motion. Atoms and molecules have kinetic energy because they are always moving, although not necessarily in any particular direction. The faster a molecule moves, the greater its kinetic energy. The kinetic energy associated with the random movement of atoms or molecules is called Thermal energy Thermal energy is related to temperature, but they are not the same thing. Temperature represents the average kinetic energy of the molecules in a body of matter, regardless of volume, whereas the thermal energy of a body of matter reflects the total kinetic energy, and thus depends on the matter's volume. When water is heated in a coffee maker, the average speed of the molecules increases, and the thermometer records this as a rise in temperature of the liquid. The total amount of thermal energy also increases in this case. Note, however, that although the pot of coffee has a much higher temperature than, say, the water in a swimming pool, the swimming pool contains more thermal energy because of its much greater volume. Whenever two objects of different temperature are brought together, thermal energy passes from the warmer to the cooler object until the two are the same temperature. Molecules in the cooler object speed up at the expense of the thermal energy of the warmer object. 
An ice cube cools a drink not by adding coldness to the liquid but by absorbing thermal energy from the liquid as the ice itself melts. Thermal energy in transfer from one body of matter to another is defined as heat. One convenient unit of heat used in this book is the calorie, cal. A calorie is the amount of heat it takes to raise the temperature of 1 g of water by 1 degree Celsius. Conversely, a calorie is also the amount of heat that 1 g of water releases when it cools by 1 degree Celsius. A kilocalorie, kcal, 1000 calories, is the quantity of heat required to raise the temperature of 1 kilogram, kg, of water by 1 degree Celsius. The calories on food packages are actually kilocalories. Another energy unit used in this book is the joule, j. 1 joule equals 0.239 calories, 1 calorie equals 4.184 j. Water's high specific heat. The ability of water to stabilize temperature stems from its relatively high specific heat. The specific heat of a substance is defined as the amount of heat that must be absorbed or lost for 1 g of that substance to change its temperature by 1 degree Celsius. We already know water's specific heat because we have defined a calorie as the amount of heat that causes 1 g of water to change its temperature by 1 degree Celsius. Therefore, the specific heat of water is 1 calorie per gram and per degree Celsius, abbreviated as 1 cal slash, g degree C. Compared with most other substances, water has an unusually high specific heat. For example, ethyl alcohol, the type of alcohol in alcoholic beverages, has a specific heat of 0.6 cal slash, g degree C, that is, only 0.6 calories is required to raise the temperature of 1 g of ethyl alcohol by 1 degree Celsius. Because of the high specific heat of water relative to other materials, water will change its temperature less than other liquids when it absorbs or loses a given amount of heat. The reason you can burn your fingers by touching the side of an iron pot on the stove when the water in the pot is still lukewarm is that the specific heat of water is 10 times greater than that of iron. In other words, the same amount of heat will raise the temperature of 1 g of the iron much faster than it will raise the temperature of 1 g of the water. Specific heat can be thought of as a measure of how well a substance resists changing its temperature when it absorbs or releases heat. Water resists changing its temperature, when it does change its temperature, it absorbs or loses a relatively large quantity of heat for each degree of change. We can trace water's high specific heat, like many of its other properties, to hydrogen bonding. Heat must be absorbed in order to break hydrogen bonds, by the same token, heat is released when hydrogen bonds form. A calorie of heat causes a relatively small change in the temperature of water because much of the heat is used to disrupt hydrogen bonds before the water molecules can begin moving faster. And when the temperature of water drops slightly, many additional hydrogen bonds form, releasing a considerable amount of energy in the form of heat. What is the relevance of water's high specific heat to life on Earth? A large body of water can absorb and store a huge amount of heat from the sun in the daytime and during summer while warming up only a few degrees. At night and during winter, the gradually cooling water can warm the air. This capability of water serves to moderate air temperatures in coastal areas. Figure 3.5 the high specific heat of water also tends to stabilize ocean temperatures, creating a favorable environment for marine life. Thus, because of its high specific heat, the water that covers most of Earth keeps temperature fluctuations on land and in water within limits that permit life. Also, because organisms are made primarily of water, they are better able to resist changes in their own temperature than if they were made of a liquid with a lower specific heat. Figure 3.5 Temperatures for the Pacific Ocean and Southern California on an August day Figure 3.5 Full Alternative Text Interpret the data explain the pattern of temperatures shown in this diagram. Evaporative Cooling Molecules of any liquid stay close together because they are attracted to one another. Molecules moving fast enough to overcome these attractions can depart the liquid and enter the air as a gas, vapor. This transformation from a liquid to a gas is called vaporization, or evaporation. Recall that the speed of molecular movement varies and that temperature is the average kinetic energy of molecules. Even at low temperatures, the speediest molecules can escape into the air. Some evaporation occurs at any temperature, a glass of water at room temperature, for example, will eventually evaporate completely. If a liquid is heated, the average kinetic energy of molecules increases and the liquid evaporates more rapidly. Heat of vaporization is the quantity of heat a liquid must absorb for 1 g of it to be converted from the liquid to the gaseous state. For the same reason that water has a high specific heat, it also has a high heat of vaporization relative to most other liquids. To evaporate 1 g of water at 25 degrees Celsius, about 580 calories of heat is needed nearly double the amount needed to vaporize a gram of alcohol or ammonia. Water's high heat of vaporization is another emergent property resulting from the strength of its hydrogen bonds, 
which must be broken before the molecules can exit from the liquid in the form of water vapor. The high amount of energy required to vaporize water has a wide range of effects. On a global scale, for example, it helps moderate Earth's climate. A considerable amount of solar heat absorbed by tropical seas is consumed during the evaporation of surface water. Then, as moist tropical air circulates poleward, it releases heat as it condenses and forms rain. On an organismal level, water's high heat of vaporization accounts for the severity of steam burns. These burns are caused by the heat energy released, during formation of hydrogen bonds, when steam condenses into liquid on the skin. As a liquid evaporates, the surface of the liquid that remains behind cools down, its temperature decreases. This evaporative cooling occurs because the hottest molecules, those with the greatest kinetic energy, are the most likely to leave as gas. It is as if the 100 fastest runners at a college transferred to another school, the average speed of the remaining students would decline. Evaporative cooling of water contributes to the stability of temperature in lakes and ponds and also provides a mechanism that prevents terrestrial organisms from overheating. For example, evaporation of water from the leaves of a plant helps keep the tissues in the leaves from becoming too warm in the sunlight. Evaporation of sweat from human skin dissipates body heat and helps prevent overheating on a hot day or when excess heat is generated by strenuous activity. High humidity on a hot day increases discomfort because the high concentration of water vapor in the air inhibits the evaporation of sweat from the body. Animals without sweat glands, such as elephants, may spray water on themselves to cool down. Figure 3.6 Figure 3.6 Evaporative Cooling In hot weather, an elephant sprays water from its trunk onto its head. Evaporation of this water cools the elephant down. Floating of ice on liquid water Water is one of the few substances that are less dense as a solid than as a liquid. As a result, ice floats on liquid water. While other materials contract and become denser when they solidify, water expands. The cause of this exotic behavior is, once again, hydrogen bonding. At temperatures above 4 degrees Celsius, water behaves like other liquids, expanding as it warms and contracting as it cools. As the temperature falls from 4 degrees Celsius to 0 degrees Celsius, water begins to freeze because more and more of its molecules are moving too slowly to break hydrogen bonds. At 0 degrees Celsius, the molecules become locked into a crystalline lattice, each water molecule hydrogen bonded to four partners, C. Figure 3.1 The hydrogen bonds keep the molecules at arm's length, far enough apart to make ice about 10% less dense, 10% fewer molecules in the same volume, than liquid water at 4 degrees Celsius. When ice absorbs enough heat for its temperature to rise above 0 degrees Celsius, hydrogen bonds between molecules are disrupted. As the crystal collapses, the ice melts and molecules have fewer hydrogen bonds, allowing them to slip closer together. Water reaches its greatest density at 4 degrees Celsius and then begins to expand as the molecules move faster. Even in liquid water, many of the molecules are connected by hydrogen bonds, though only transiently, the hydrogen bonds are constantly breaking and reforming. The ability of ice to float due to its lower density is an important factor in the suitability of the environment for life. If ice sank, then eventually ponds, lakes, and even oceans could freeze solid, making life as we know it impossible on Earth. During summer, only the upper few inches of the ocean would thaw. Instead, when a deep body of water cools, the ice floats, insulating the liquid water below. This prevents it from freezing and allows life to exist under the frozen surface, as shown in. Figure 3.1 Besides insulating the water below, ice also provides a solid habitat for some animals, such as polar bears and seals. Many scientists are worried that these bodies of ice are at risk of disappearing. Global warming, which is caused by carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, see. Figure 56.30, is having a profound effect on icy environments around the globe. In the Arctic, the average air temperature has risen 2.2 degrees Celsius just since 1961. This temperature increase has affected the seasonal balance between Arctic sea ice and liquid water, causing ice to form later in the year, to melt earlier, and to cover a smaller area. The rate at which glaciers and Arctic sea ice are disappearing is posing an extreme challenge to animals that depend on ice for their survival. Figure 3.7 Figure 3.7 Effects of Climate Change on the Arctic Warmer temperatures in the Arctic cause more sea ice to melt in the summer. The loss of ice disrupts the ecosystem, affecting many species. Map data is from the National Snow and Ice Data Center. Figure 3.7 Full Alternative Text Mastering Biology Interview with Susan Solomon, Understanding Climate Change Water, the Solvent of Life
a sugar cube placed in a glass of water will dissolve. In time, the glass will contain a uniform mixture of sugar and water, the concentration of dissolved sugar will be the same everywhere in the mixture. A liquid that is a completely homogeneous mixture of two or more substances is called a solution. The dissolving agent of a solution is the solvent, and the substance that is dissolved is the solute. In this case, water is the solvent and sugar is the solute. An aqueous solution is one in which the solute is dissolved in water, water is the solvent. Water is a very versatile solvent, a quality we can trace to the polarity of the water molecule. Suppose, for example, that a spoonful of table salt, the ionic compound sodium chloride, NaCl, is placed in water. Figure 3.8 At the surface of each crystal, grain, of salt, the sodium, and chloride ions are exposed to the solvent. These ions and regions of the water molecules are attracted to each other due to their opposite charges. The oxygens of the water molecules have regions of partial negative charge that are attracted to sodium cations. The hydrogen regions are partially positively charged and are attracted to chloride anions. As a result, water molecules surround the individual sodium and chloride ions, separating and shielding them from one another. The sphere of water molecules around each dissolved ion is called a hydration shell. Working inward from the surface of each salt crystal, water eventually dissolves all the ions. The result is a solution of two solutes, sodium cations and chloride anions, mixed homogeneously with water, the solvent. Other ionic compounds also dissolve in water. Sea water, for instance, contains a great variety of dissolved ions, as do living cells. Figure 3.8 Table salt dissolving in water A sphere of water molecules, called a hydration shell, surrounds each solute ion. What if? What would happen if you heated the solution for a long time? A compound does not need to be ionic to dissolve in water, many compounds made up of non-ionic polar molecules, such as the sugar in the sugar cube mentioned earlier, are also water-soluble. Such compounds dissolve when water molecules surround each of the solute molecules, forming hydrogen bonds with them. Even molecules as large as proteins can dissolve in water if they have ionic and polar regions on their surface. Figure 3.9 Many different kinds of polar compounds are dissolved, along with ions, in the water of such biological fluids as blood, the sap of plants, and the liquid within all cells. Water is the solvent of life. Figure 3.9 A water-soluble protein Human lysozyme is a protein found in tears and saliva that has antibacterial action, C. Figure 5.16 This model shows the lysozyme molecule, purple, in an aqueous environment. Ionic and polar regions on the protein surface attract the partially charged regions on water molecules. Hydrophilic and hydrophobic substances Any substance that has an affinity for water is said to be Hydrophilic, from the Greek hydro, water, and philos, loving. In some cases, substances can be hydrophilic without actually dissolving. For example, some molecules in cells are so large that they do not dissolve. Another example of a hydrophilic substance that does not dissolve is cotton, a plant product. Cotton consists of giant molecules of cellulose, a compound with numerous regions of partial positive and partial negative charges that can form hydrogen bonds with water. Water adheres to the cellulose fibers. Thus, a cotton towel does a great job of drying the body, yet it does not dissolve in the washing machine. Cellulose is also present in the walls of water conducting cells in a plant, you read earlier how the adhesion of water to these hydrophilic walls helps water move up the plant against gravity. There are, of course, substances that do not have an affinity for water. Substances that are non-ionic and non-polar, or otherwise cannot form hydrogen bonds, actually seem to repel water, these substances are said to be hydrophobic from the Greek phobos, fearing. An example from the kitchen is vegetable oil, which, as you know, does not mix stably with water-based substances such as vinegar. The hydrophobic behavior of the oil molecules results from a high number of relatively nonpolar covalent bonds, in this case bonds between carbon and hydrogen, which share electrons almost equally. Hydrophobic molecules related to oils are major ingredients of cell membranes. Imagine what would happen to a cell if its membrane dissolved. Solute concentration in aqueous solutions. Most of the chemical reactions in organisms involve solutes dissolved in water. To understand such reactions, we must know how many atoms and molecules are involved and calculate the concentration of solutes in an aqueous solution, the number of solute molecules in a volume of solution. When carrying out experiments, we use mass to calculate the number of molecules. We must first calculate the 
molecular mass, which is the sum of the masses of all the atoms in a molecule. As an example, let's calculate the molecular mass of table sugar, sucrose, C12H22O11, by multiplying the number of atoms by the atomic mass of each element, see the periodic table at the back of the book. In round numbers of Daltons, the mass of a carbon atom is 12, the mass of a hydrogen atom is 1, and the mass of an oxygen atom is 16. Thus, sucrose has a molecular mass of, 12 times 12, plus, 22 times 1, plus, 11 times 16, equals 342 Daltons. Because we can't weigh out small numbers of molecules, we usually measure substances in units called moles. Just as a dozen always means 12 objects, a mole, mole, represents an exact number of objects, 6.02 times 1023, which is called Avogadro's number. Because of the way in which Avogadro's number and the unit Dalton were originally defined, there are 6.02 times 1023 Daltons in 1g. Once we determine the molecular mass of a molecule such as sucrose, we can use the same number, 342, but with the unit gram, to represent the mass of 6.02 times 1023 molecules of sucrose, or 1 mole of sucrose, sometimes called the molar mass. To obtain 1 mole of sucrose in the lab, therefore, we weigh out 342 g. The practical advantage of measuring a quantity of chemicals in moles is that a mole of one substance has exactly the same number of molecules as a mole of any other substance. If the molecular mass of substance A is 342 Daltons and that of substance B is 10 Daltons, then 342 g of A will have the same number of molecules as 10 g of B. A mole of ethyl alcohol, C2H60, also contains 6.02 times 1023 molecules, but its mass is only 46 g because the mass of a molecule of ethyl alcohol is less than that of a molecule of sucrose. Measure mole, mole, represents an exact molecular mass, which is the sum of the mass. When carrying out experiments, we use mass to calculate the number of molecules. We must first calculate the molecular mass, which is the sum of the masses of all the atoms in a molecule. As an example, let's calculate the molecular mass of table sugar, sucrose, C12H22O11, by multiplying the number of atoms by the atomic mass of each element, see the periodic table at the back of the book. In round numbers of Daltons, the mass of a carbon atom is 12, the mass of a hydrogen atom is 1, and the mass of an oxygen atom is 16. Thus, sucrose has a molecular mass of, 12 times 12, plus, 22 times 1, plus, 11 times 16, equals 342 Daltons. Because we can't weigh out small numbers of molecules, we usually measure substances in units called moles. Just as a dozen always means 12 objects, a mole, mole, represents an exact number of objects, 6.02 times 1023, which is called Avogadro's number. Because of the way in which Avogadro's number and the unit Dalton were originally defined, there are 6.02 times 1023 Daltons in 1g. Once we determine the molecular mass of a molecule such as sucrose, we can use the same number, 342, but with the unit gram, to represent the mass of 6.02 times 1023 molecules of sucrose, or 1 mole of sucrose, sometimes called the molar mass. To obtain 1 mole of sucrose in the lab, therefore, we weigh out 342g. The practical advantage of measuring a quantity of chemicals in moles is that a mole of one substance has exactly the same number of molecules as a mole of any other substance. If the molecular mass of substance A is 342 Daltons and that of substance B is 10 Daltons, then 342 g of A will have the same number of molecules as 10 g of B. A mole of ethyl alcohol, C2H60, also contains 6.02 times 1023 molecules, but its mass is only 46 g because the mass of a molecule of ethyl alcohol is less than that of a molecule of sucrose. Measuring in moles makes it convenient for scientists working in the laboratory to combine substances in fixed ratios of molecules. How would we make a liter, L, of solution consisting of one mole of sucrose dissolved in water? We would measure out 342 g of sucrose and then gradually add water, while stirring, until the sugar was completely dissolved. We would then add enough water to bring the total volume of the solution up to 1 L. At that point, we would have a 1 molar, 1 m, solution of sucrose. Molarity The number of moles of solute per liter of solution is the unit of concentration most often used by biologists for aqueous solutions. Water's capacity as a versatile solvent complements the other properties discussed in this chapter. Since these remarkable properties allow water to support life on Earth so well, scientists who seek life elsewhere in the universe look for water as a sign that a planet might sustain life. Mastering Biology MP3 Tutor, The Properties of Water Possible Evolution of Life on Other Planets 
Evolution biologists who look for life elsewhere in the universe, known as astrobiologists, have concentrated their search on planets that might have water. More than 800 planets have been found outside our solar system, with evidence for the presence of water vapor on a few. In our own solar system, Mars has been a focus of study. Like Earth, Mars has an ice cap at both poles. Images from spacecraft sent to Mars showed that ice is present just under the surface of Mars and that enough water vapor exists in its atmosphere for frost to form. In 2015, scientists found evidence of water flowing on Mars. Figure 3.10, and a study using radar in 2018 concluded there is a large reservoir of liquid water one mile below surface ice. Drilling below the surface may be the next step in the search for signs of life on Mars. If any life forms or fossils are found, their study will shed light on the process of evolution from an entirely new perspective. Figure 3.10 Evidence for liquid water on Mars Water appears to have helped form these dark streaks that run downhill on Mars during the summer. NASA scientists also found evidence of hydrated salts, indicating water is present. This digitally treated photograph was taken by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Concept Check 3.2 Describe how properties of water contribute to the upward movement of water in a tree. Explain the saying it's not the heat, it's the humidity. How can the freezing of water crack boulders? What if a water strider, an insect that can walk on water, has legs that are coated with a hydrophobic substance? What might be the benefit? What would happen if the substance were hydrophilic? Interpret the data the concentration of the appetite-regulating hormone ghrelin is about 1.3 times 1010 10 m in the blood of a fasting person. How many molecules of ghrelin are in 1 L of blood? Concept 3.3 Acidic and basic conditions affect living organisms. Occasionally, a hydrogen atom participating in a hydrogen bond between two water molecules shifts from one molecule to the other. When this happens, the hydrogen atom leaves its electron behind, and what is actually transferred is a hydrogen ion H+, plus. a single proton with a charge of 1+. Plus. The water molecule that lost a proton is now a hydroxide ion O, which has a charge of 1. The proton binds to the other water molecule, making that molecule a hydronium ion H3O+. We can picture the chemical reaction as follows. Mastering biology. Animation, dissociation of water molecules. By convention, the hydrogen ion is used to represent the hydronium ion, and we follow that practice in this book. Keep in mind, though, that does not exist on its own in an aqueous solution. It is always associated with a water molecule in the form of As indicated by the double arrows, this is a reversible reaction that reaches a state of dynamic equilibrium when water molecules dissociate at the same rate that they are being reformed from and At this equilibrium point, the concentration of water molecules greatly exceeds the concentrations of and In pure water, only one water molecule in every 554 million is dissociated, the concentration of N of in pure water is therefore this means there is only one ten millionth of a mole of hydrogen ions per liter of pure water and an equal number of hydroxide ions. Even so, this is a huge number over 60,000 trillion of each ion in a liter of pure water. Although the dissociation of water is reversible and statistically rare, it is exceedingly important in the chemistry of life. And are very reactive. Changes in their concentrations can drastically affect a cell's proteins and other complex molecules. As we have seen, the concentrations of N are equal in pure water, but adding certain kinds of solutes, called acids, and bases, disrupts this balance. Biologists use something called the pH scale to describe how acidic or basic, the opposite of acidic, a solution is. In the remainder of this chapter, you will learn about acids, bases, and pH and why changes in pH can adversely affect organisms, acids and bases. What would cause an aqueous solution to have an imbalance in and concentrations? When acids dissolve in water, they donate additional to the solution. Acid is a substance that increases the hydrogen ion concentration of a solution. For example, when hydrochloric acid, HCl, is added to water, hydrogen ions dissociate from chloride ions. This source of, dissociation of water is the other source, results in an acidic solution one having more than. A substance that reduces the hydrogen ion concentration of a solution is called a. Base. 
some bases reduce the concentration directly by accepting hydrogen ions. Ammonia, for instance, acts as a base when the unshared electron pair in nitrogen's valence shell attracts a hydrogen ion from the solution, resulting in an ammonium ion. Other bases reduce the concentration indirectly by dissociating to form hydroxide ions, which combine with hydrogen ions and form water. One such base is sodium hydroxide, NaOH, which in water dissociates into its ions. In either case, the base reduces the concentration. Solutions with a higher concentration of than are known as basic solutions. A solution in which the N concentrations are equal is said to be neutral. Notice that single arrows were used in the reactions for HCl and NaOH. These compounds dissociate completely when mixed with water, so hydrochloric acid is called a strong acid and sodium hydroxide a strong base. In contrast, ammonia is a weak base. The double arrows in the reaction for ammonia indicate that the binding and release of hydrogen ions are reversible reactions, although at equilibrium there will be a fixed ratio of 2. Weak acids are acids that reversibly release and accept back hydrogen ions. An example is carbonic acid. Here the equilibrium so favors the reaction in the left direction that when carbonic acid is added to pure water, only 1% of the molecules are dissociated at any particular time. Still, that is enough to shift the balance of N from neutrality. The pH scale In any aqueous solution at, the product of the N concentrations is constant at. This can be written. The brackets indicate molar concentration. As previously mentioned, in a neutral solution at, and. Therefore, the product of N in a neutral solution at is. If enough acid is added to a solution to increase to, then will decline by an equivalent factor to, note that. This constant relationship expresses the behavior of acids and bases in an aqueous solution. An acid not only adds hydrogen ions to a solution, but also removes hydroxide ions because of the tendency for to combine with, forming water. A base has the opposite effect, increasing concentration but also reducing concentration by the formation of water. If enough of a base is added to raise the concentration to, it will cause the concentration to drop to. Whenever we know the concentration of either or in an aqueous solution, we can deduce the concentration of the other ion. The pH scale Figure 3.11 is a simple numerical method for expressing the range of concentrations. The concentrations of solutions can vary by a factor of 100 trillion or more. Instead of using moles per liter, the pH scale compresses the range of concentrations by employing logarithms. The pH of a solution is defined as the negative logarithm, base 10, of the concentration. Figure 3.11 The pH scale and pH values of some aqueous solutions. Figure 3.11 Full alternative text. Mastering biology. Animation, acids, bases, and pH. For a neutral aqueous solution, is, giving us. Notice that pH decreases as concentration increases, see. Figure 3.11. Notice, too, that although the pH scale is based on concentration, it also implies concentration. A solution of pH 10 has a hydrogen ion concentration of and a hydroxide ion concentration of. The pH of a neutral aqueous solution at is 7, the midpoint of the pH scale. A pH value less than 7 denotes an acidic solution, the lower the number, the more acidic the solution. The pH for basic solutions is above 7. Most biological fluids, such as blood and saliva, are within the range of pH 6 to 8. There are a few exceptions, however, including the strongly acidic digestive juice of the human stomach, gastric juice, which has a pH of about 2. Remember that each pH unit represents a tenfold difference in N concentrations. It is this mathematical feature that makes the pH scale so compact. A solution of pH 3 is not twice as acidic as a solution of pH 6, but 1000 times more acidic. When the pH of a solution changes slightly, the actual concentrations of N in the solution change substantially. Buffers The internal pH of most living cells is close to 7. Even a slight change in pH can be harmful because the chemical processes of the cell are very sensitive to the concentrations of hydrogen and hydroxide ions. The pH of human blood is very close to 7.4, which is slightly basic. A person cannot survive for more than a few minutes if the blood pH drops to 7 or rises to 7.8, and a chemical system exists in the blood that maintains a stable pH. If 0.01 mole of a strong acid is added to a liter of pure water, the pH drops from 7.0 to 2.0. If the same amount of acid is added to a liter of blood, however, the pH decrease is only from 7.4 to 7.3. Why does the addition of acid have so much less of an effect on the pH of blood than it does on the pH of water? 
the presence of substances called buffers allows biological fluids to maintain a relatively constant pH despite the addition of acids or bases. A. Buffer is a substance that minimizes changes in the concentrations of and in a solution. It does so by accepting hydrogen ions from the solution when they are in excess and donating hydrogen ions to the solution when they have been depleted. Most buffer solutions contain a weak acid and its corresponding base, which combine reversibly with hydrogen ions. Several buffers contribute to pH stability in human blood and many other biological solutions. One of these is carbonic acid, which is formed when reacts with water in blood plasma. As mentioned earlier, carbonic acid dissociates to yield a bicarbonate ion and a hydrogen ion. The chemical equilibrium between carbonic acid and bicarbonate acts as a pH regulator, the reaction shifting left or right as other processes in the solution add or remove hydrogen ions. If the concentration in blood begins to fall, that is, if pH rises, the reaction proceeds to the right and more carbonic acid dissociates, replenishing hydrogen ions. But when the concentration in blood begins to rise, when pH drops, the reaction proceeds to the left, with, the base, removing the hydrogen ions from the solution and forming. Thus, the carbonic acid, bicarbonate buffering system consists of an acid and a base in equilibrium with each other. Most other buffers are also acid-base pairs. Acidification, a threat to our oceans. Among the many threats to water quality posed by human activities is the burning of fossil fuels, which releases into the atmosphere. The resulting increase in atmospheric levels has caused global warming and other aspects of climate change, see. Concept 56.4. In addition, about 25% of human generated is absorbed by the oceans. In spite of the huge volume of water in the oceans, scientists worry that the absorption of so much will harm marine ecosystems. Recent data have shown that such fears are well founded. When dissolves in seawater, it reacts with water to form carbonic acid, which lowers ocean pH. This process, known as ocean acidification, alters the delicate balance of conditions for life in the oceans. Figure 3.12 Based on measurements of the level in air bubbles trapped in ice over thousands of years, scientists calculate that the pH of the oceans is 0.1 pH unit lower, more acidic, now than at any time in the past 420,000 years. Recent studies predict that it will drop another 0.3 to 0.5 pH unit by the end of the century. Figure 3.12 Atmospheric from human activities and its fate in the ocean. Figure 3.12 Full alternative text. Visual skills summarize the effect of adding excess to the oceans on the calcification process in the final equation. As seawater acidifies, the extra hydrogen ions combine with carbonate ions to form bicarbonate ions, thereby reducing the carbonate ion concentration, C. Figure 3.12 Scientists predict that ocean acidification will cause the carbonate ion concentration to decrease by 40% by the year 2100. This is of great concern because carbonate ions are required for calcification, the production of calcium carbonate by many marine organisms, including reef-building corals and animals that build shells. The scientific skills exercise allows you to work with data from an experiment examining the effect of carbonate ion concentration on coral reefs, using an artificial system. In 2018, researchers carried out the first enhancement study on an unconfined natural coral reef, observing that addition of suppressed calcification and concluding that ocean acidification is likely to cause profound, ecosystem-wide changes in coral reefs. Coral reefs are sensitive ecosystems that act as havens for a great diversity of marine life. The disappearance of coral reef ecosystems would be a tragic loss of biological diversity. If there is any reason for optimism about the future quality of water resources on our planet, it is that we have made progress in learning about the delicate chemical balances in oceans, lakes, and rivers. Continued progress can come only from the actions of informed individuals, like yourselves, who are concerned about environmental quality. This requires understanding the crucial role that water plays in the suitability of the environment for continued life on Earth. Concept Check 3.3 Compared with a basic solution at pH 9, the same volume of an acidic solution at pH 4 has times as many hydrogen ions. HCl is a strong acid that dissociates in water, what is the pH of 0.01 mHCl? Acetic acid can be a buffer, similar to carbonic acid. Write the dissociation reaction, identifying the acid, base, acceptor, and donor. What if? Given a liter of pure water and a liter solution of acetic acid, what would happen to the pH, in general, if you added 0.01 mole of a strong acid to each? Use the reaction from question 3 to explain the result. For suggested answers, see. Appendix A. 
Scientific Skills Exercise Interpreting a Scatter Plot with a Regression Line How does the carbonate ion concentration of seawater affect the calcification rate of a coral reef? Scientists predict that acidification of the ocean due to higher levels of atmospheric will lower the concentration of dissolved carbonate ions, which living corals use to build calcium carbonate reef structures. In this exercise, you will analyze data from a controlled experiment that examined the effect of carbonate ion concentration on calcium carbonate deposition, a process called calcification. How the experiment was done for several years, scientists conducted research on ocean acidification using a large coral reef aquarium at Biosphere 2 in Arizona. They measured the rate of calcification by the reef organisms and examined how the calcification rate changed with differing amounts of dissolved carbonate ions in the seawater. Data from the experiment The black data points in the graph form a scatter plot. The red line, known as a linear regression line, is the best fitting straight line for these points. Data from C. Langdon ETAL, Effect of Calcium Carbonate Saturation State on the Calcification Rate of an Experimental Coral Reef, Global Biogeochemical Cycles 14 639, 654, 2000. 3.3 to 7 Full Alternative Text Interpret the data. When presented with a graph of experimental data, the first step in analysis is to determine what each axis represents. A. In words, what is shown on the x-axis? Include the units. B. What is on the y-axis? C. Which variable is the independent variable the one that was manipulated by the researchers? D. Which is the dependent variable the one that responded to or depended on the treatment, which was measured by the researchers? For additional information about graphs, see the scientific skills review in Appendix D. Based on the data shown in the graph, describe in words the relationship between carbonate ion concentration and calcification rate. A. If the seawater carbonate ion concentration is, estimate the rate of calcification and how many days it would take 1 square meter of reef to accumulate 30 mol of calcium carbonate. B. If the seawater carbonate ion concentration is, what is the approximate rate of calcification, and approximately how many days would it take 1 square meter of reef to accumulate 30 mol of calcium carbonate. C. If the carbonate ion concentration decreases, how does the calcification rate change, and how does that affect the time it takes coral to grow? A. Which step of the process in? Figure 3.12 is measured in this experiment. B. Are the results of this experiment consistent with the hypothesis that increased atmospheric will slow the growth of coral reefs? Why or why not? Instructors, a version of this scientific skills exercise can be assigned in mastering biology. Summary of Key Concepts Go to Mastering Biology for Assignments, the e-text, the study area, and dynamic study modules. To review key terms, go to the Vocabulary Self-Quiz in the Mastering Biology e-text or study area, or go to goo.gl slash zkjz90. Concept 3.1 Polar Covalent Bonds in Water Molecules Result in Hydrogen Bonding, p. 45. Water is a polar molecule. A hydrogen bond forms when a partially negatively charged region on the oxygen of one water molecule is attracted to the partially positively charged hydrogen of a nearby water molecule. Hydrogen bonding between water molecules is the basis for water's properties. 3.2 to 9 Full Alternative Text Draw IT label a hydrogen bond and a polar covalent bond in the diagram of five water molecules. Is a hydrogen bond a covalent bond? Explain. Concept 3.24 Emergent Properties of Water Contribute to Earth Suitability for Life, pp. 45. 50. Hydrogen bonding keeps water molecules close to each other, giving water cohesion. Hydrogen bonding is also responsible for water's surface tension. Water has a high specific heat, heat is absorbed when hydrogen bonds break and is released when hydrogen bonds form. This helps keep temperatures relatively steady, within limits that permit life. Evaporative cooling is based on water's high heat of vaporization. The evaporative loss of the most energetic water molecules cools a surface. Ice floats because it is less dense than liquid water. This property allows life to exist under the frozen surfaces of lakes and polar seas. Water is an unusually versatile solvent because its polar molecules are attracted to ions and polar substances that can form hydrogen bonds. Hydrophilic substances have an affinity for water, 
hydrophobic substances do not. Molarity, the number of moles of solute per liter of solution, is used as a measure of solute concentration in solutions. A mole is a certain number of molecules of a substance. The mass of a mole of a substance in grams is the same as the molecular mass in Daltons. The emergent properties of water support life on Earth and may contribute to the potential for life to have evolved on other planets. Describe how different types of solutes dissolve in water. Explain what a solution is. Concept 3.3 Acidic and basic conditions affect living organisms, pp. 51. 54. A water molecule can transfer into another water molecule to form, represented simply by, and. The concentration of is expressed as pH. A buffer consists of an acid-base pair that combines reversibly with hydrogen ions, allowing it to resist pH changes. 3.2 to 10 full alternative text. The burning of fossil fuels increases the amount of in the atmosphere. Some dissolves in the oceans, causing ocean acidification, which has potentially grave consequences for marine organisms that rely on calcification. Explain what happens to the concentration of hydrogen ions in an aqueous solution when you add a base and cause the concentration of to rise to. What is the pH of the solution? Test your understanding. For more multiple choice questions, go to the practice test in the Mastering Biology e-text or study area, or go to goo.gl slash gruwrg. Levels 1 to 2, Remembering slash Understanding. Which of the following is a hydrophobic material? Paper. Table salt. Wax. Sugar. We can be sure that a mole of table sugar and a mole of vitamin C are equal in their mass, volume, number of atoms, number of molecules. Measurements show that the pH of a particular lake is 4.0. What is the hydrogen ion concentration of the lake? 4.0 m. What is the hydroxide ion concentration of the lake described in question 3? 10.0 m. Levels 3 to 4, applying slash analyzing. A slice of pizza has 500 kilocalories. If we could burn the pizza and use all the heat to warm a 50L container of cold water, what would be the approximate increase in the temperature of the water? Note, a liter of cold water weighs about 1 kilogram. Draw IT draw the hydration shells that form around a potassium ion and a chloride ion when potassium chloride, KCl, dissolves. Label the positive, negative, and partial charges. Levels 5 to 6, Evaluating slash Creating Right before a predicted overnight freeze, farmers spray water on crops to protect the plants. Use the properties of water to explain how this method works. Be sure to mention why hydrogen bonds are responsible for this phenomenon. Make connections what do climate change, see. Concepts 1.1 and 3.2, and ocean acidification have in common? Evolution Connection This chapter explains how the emergent properties of water contribute to the suitability of the environment for life. Until fairly recently, scientists assumed that other physical requirements for life included a moderate range of temperature, pH, atmospheric pressure, and salinity, as well as low levels of toxic chemicals. That view has changed with the discovery of organisms known as extremophiles, which flourish in hot, acidic sulfur springs, around hydrothermal vents deep in the ocean, and in soils with high levels of toxic metals. Why would astrobiologists study extremophiles? What does the existence of life in such extreme environments say about the possibility of life on other planets? Scientific inquiry design a controlled experiment to test the hypothesis that water acidification caused by acidic rain would inhibit the growth of Elodia, a freshwater plant, see. Figure 2.17 Write about a theme, organization several emergent properties of water contribute to the suitability of the environment for life. In a short essay, 100 to 150 words, describe how the ability of water to function as a versatile solvent arises from the structure of water molecules. Synthesize your knowledge. How do cats drink? Scientists using high-speed video have shown that cats use an interesting technique to drink aqueous substances like water and milk. Four times a second, the cat touches the tip of its tongue to the water and draws a column of water up into its mouth, as you can see in the photo, which then shuts before gravity can pull the water back down. Describe how the properties of water allow cats to drink in this fashion, 
including how water's molecular structure contributes to the process. For selected answers, see Appendix A Explore scientific papers with science in the classroom AAAS How are coral reefs responding to climate change? Go to take the heat at For carbon and the molecular diversity of life Figure 4.1 the kindling golden snub-nosed monkeys and other living organisms in this mountainous forest in southwest China are made up of chemicals based mostly on the element carbon. Of all chemical elements, carbon is unparalleled in its ability to form molecules that are large, complex, and varied, making possible the diversity of organisms that have evolved on Earth. 4.1 to 1 full alternative text. Key concepts. 4.1 organic chemistry is key to the origin of life of 57. 4.2 Carbon atoms can form diverse molecules by bonding to four other atoms. 58. 4.3 A few chemical groups are key to molecular function. 62. Study tip. Label chemical groups, after you have read through. Figure 4.9, look through. Chapters 4 and 5 for molecules that have the chemical groups shown in that figure. Circle and label the chemical groups you find, as in the following example. Go to Mastering Biology. For students, in e-text and study area. Get ready for Chapter 4 Animation, Diversity of Carbon-Based Molecules Animation, Functional Groups For instructors to assign, in item library. Activity, Isomers Tutorial, Carbon Bonding and Functional Groups Concept 4.1 Organic Chemistry is key to the origin of life. For historical reasons, compounds containing carbon are said to be organic, and their study is called Organic Chemistry Organic compounds range from simple molecules, such as methane, CH4, to colossal ones, such as proteins, with thousands of atoms. Evolution In 1953, Stanley Miller, a graduate student of Harold Urey at the University of Chicago, designed an experiment on the abiotic, non-living, synthesis of organic compounds to investigate the origin of life. Study Figure 4.2 to learn about his classic experiment. From his results, Miller concluded that complex organic molecules could arise spontaneously under conditions thought at that time to have existed on early Earth. You can work with the data from a related experiment in the Scientific Skills Exercise. These experiments support the idea that abiotic synthesis of organic compounds, perhaps near volcanoes, could have been an early stage in the origin of life, see. Figure 25.2 Figure 4.2 Inquiry can organic molecules form under conditions estimated to simulate those on the early Earth? Experiment in 1953, Stanley Miller set up a closed system to mimic conditions thought at that time to have existed on the early Earth. A flask of water simulated the primeval sea. The water was heated so that some vaporized and moved into a second, higher flask containing the atmosphere a mixture of gases. Sparks were discharged in the synthetic atmosphere to mimic lightning. 4.123 Full Alternative Text Results Miller identified a variety of organic molecules that are common in organisms. These included simple compounds, such as formaldehyde, and hydrogen cyanide, HCN, and more complex molecules, such as amino acids and long chains of carbon and hydrogen known as hydrocarbons. Conclusion Organic molecules, a first step in the origin of life, may have been synthesized abiotically on the early Earth. Although later evidence indicated that the early Earth atmosphere was different from the atmosphere used by Miller in this experiment, Recent experiments using the revised list of chemicals also produced organic molecules. We will explore this hypothesis in more detail in Concept 25.1 Data from S. L. Miller, a production of amino acids under possible primitive earth conditions, Science 117,528, 529, 1953 What if? If Miller had increased the concentration of in his experiment, how might the relative amounts of the products HCNN have differed? 
Concept 3.2, you learned about evidence for the presence of water on Mars. Even more exciting, in 2018, NASA reported that the rover Curiosity had found carbon-based compounds on Mars in a crater where a lake once existed. While these compounds might have been brought to Mars on a meteorite or formed by geologic processes, an intriguing possibility is that they might have been the relics of life forms that once existed on that planet. The overall percentages of the major elements of life C, H, O, N, S, and P are quite uniform from one organism to another, reflecting the common evolutionary origin of all life. Because of carbon's ability to form four bonds, however, this limited assortment of atomic building blocks can be used to build an inexhaustible variety of organic molecules. Different species of organisms, and different individuals within a species, are distinguished by variations in the types of organic molecules they make. In a sense, the great diversity of living organisms we see on the planet, and in fossil remains, is made possible by the unique chemical versatility of the carbon atom. Mastering Biology Interview with Stanley Miller, Investigating the Origin of Life Concept Check 4.1 Visual Skills C Figure 4.2 Miller carried out a control experiment without discharging sparks and found no organic compounds. What might explain this result? Four suggested answers, C. Appendix A Scientific Skills Exercise Working with moles and molar ratios Could the first biological molecules have formed near volcanoes on early Earth? In 2007, Jeffrey Botta, a former graduate student of Stanley Miller, discovered some vials of samples that had never been analyzed from an experiment performed by Miller in 1958. In that experiment, Miller used hydrogen sulfide gas, as one of the gases in the reactant mixture. Since is released by volcanoes, the experiment was designed to mimic conditions near volcanoes on early Earth. In 2011, Botta and colleagues published the results of their analysis of these lost samples. In this exercise, you will make calculations using the molar ratios of reactants and products from the experiment. Some of Stanley Miller's notes from his 1958 hydrogen sulfide experiment along with his original vials. How the experiment was done according to his laboratory notebook, Miller used the same apparatus as in his original experiment, see. Figure 4.2, but the mixture of gaseous reactants included methane, carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, and ammonia. After three days of simulated volcanic activity, he collected samples of the liquid, partially purified the chemicals, and sealed the samples in sterile vials. In 2011, Bada's research team used modern analytical methods to analyze the products in the vials for the presence of amino acids, the building blocks of proteins. Data from the experiment The table below shows four of the 23 amino acids detected in the 2011 analysis of the samples from Miller's 1958 experiment. Product Compound Molecular Formula Molar Ratio, Relative to Glycin Glycin 1.0 Serine Methionine Alanine 1.1 Data from E.T. Parker E.T.A.L., Primordial Synthesis of Amines and Amino Acids in a 1958 Miller-Rich Spark Discharge Experiment, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences USA 108-5526-5531, 2011 www.pnas.org slash cgi slash doi slash 10.1073 slash pnas.10191919108 Interpret the data. A mole is the number of particles of a substance with a mass equivalent to its molecular, or atomic, mass in Daltons. There are molecules, or atoms, in 1.0 mole, Avogadro's number, c. Concept 3.2 the data table shows the molar ratios of some of the products from the Miller experiment. In a molar ratio, each unitless value is expressed relative to a standard for that experiment. Here, the standard is the number of moles of the amino acid glycine, which is set to a value of 1.0. For instance, serine has a molar ratio of, meaning that for every mole of glycine, there is mole of serine. A. Give the molar ratio of methionine to glycine and explain what it means. B. How many molecules of glycine are present in 1.0 mole? C. For every 1.0 mole of glycine in the sample, how many molecules of methionine are present? Recall that to multiply two numbers with exponents, you add their exponents, to divide them, you subtract the exponent in the denominator from that in the numerator. A. Which amino acid is present in higher amounts than glycine? B. How many more molecules of that amino acid are present than the number of molecules in 1.0 mole of glycine? 
the synthesis of products is limited by the amount of reactants. A. If one mole each of, and is added to one liter of water, moles of, in a flask, how many moles of hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur are in the flask? B. Looking at the molecular formula in the table, how many moles of each element would be needed to make 1.0 mole of glycin? C. What is the maximum number of moles of glycin that could be made in that flask, with the specified ingredients, if no other molecules were made? Explain. D. If serine or methionine were made individually, which element, S, would be used up first for each? How much of each product could be made? The earlier published experiment carried out by Miller did not include in the reactants, C. Figure 4.2 which of the compounds shown in the data table can be made in the experiment but could not be made in the earlier experiment? Instructors, a version of the scientific skills exercise can be assigned in mastering biology. Concept 4.2 Carbon atoms can form diverse molecules by bonding to four other atoms. The key to an atom's chemical characteristics is its electron configuration. This configuration determines the kinds and number of bonds an atom will form with other atoms. Recall that it is the valence electrons, those in the outermost shell, that are available to form bonds with other atoms. The formation of bonds with carbon. Carbon has six electrons, with two in the first electron shell and four in the second shell, thus, it has four valence electrons in a shell that can hold up to eight electrons. A carbon atom usually completes its valence shell by sharing its four electrons with other atoms so that eight electrons are present. Each pair of shared electrons constitutes a covalent bond, C. Figure 2.10D. In organic molecules, carbon usually forms single or double covalent bonds. Each carbon atom acts as an intersection point from which a molecule can branch off in as many as four directions. This enables carbon to form large, complex molecules. When a carbon atom forms four single covalent bonds, the arrangement of its four hybrid orbitals causes the bonds to angle toward the corners of an imaginary tetrahedron. The bond angles in methane, CH4, are 109.5 degrees. Figure 4.3a, and they are roughly the same in any group of atoms where carbon has four single bonds. For example, ethane, C2H6, is shaped like two overlapping tetrahedrons. Figure 4.3b. In molecules with more carbons, Every grouping of a carbon bonded to four other atoms has a tetrahedral shape. But when two carbon atoms are joined by a double bond, as in ethene, C2H4, the bonds from both carbons are all in the same plane, so the atoms joined to those carbons are in the same plane as well. Figure 4.3c. We find it convenient to write molecules as structural formulas, as if the molecules being represented are two-dimensional, but keep in mind that molecules are three-dimensional and that the shape of a molecule is central to its function. Figure 4.3 The shapes of three simple organic molecules. Figure 4.3 Full alternative text. The number of electrons required to fill the valence shell of an atom is generally equal to the atoms. Valence, the number of covalent bonds it can form. Figure 4.4 shows the valences of carbon and its most frequent bonding partners hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. These are the four main atoms in organic molecules. Figure 4.4 Valences of the major elements of organic molecules. Valence, the number of covalent bonds an atom can form, is generally equal to the number of electrons required to fill the valence shell. Sodium, phosphorus, and chlorine are exceptions. Figure 4.4 Full alternative text. Make connections draw the Lewis dot structures for sodium, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine. Refer to. Figure 2.7.
the electron configuration of carbon gives it covalent compatibility with many different elements. Let's consider how valence and the rules of covalent bonding apply to carbon atoms with partners other than hydrogen. We'll look at two examples, the simple molecules carbon dioxide and urea. In the carbon dioxide molecule, CO2, a single carbon atom is joined to two atoms of oxygen by double covalent bonds. The structural formula for CO2 is shown here. OCO Each line in a structural formula represents a pair of shared electrons. Thus, the two double bonds in CO2 have the same number of shared electrons as four single bonds. The arrangement completes the valence shells of all atoms in the molecule. 4.227 Full Alternative Text because CO2 is a very simple molecule and lacks hydrogen, it is often considered inorganic, even though it contains carbon. Whether we call CO2 organic or inorganic, however, it is clearly important to the living world as the source of carbon, via photosynthetic organisms, for all organic molecules in organisms, see. Concept 2.4 Urea, CO, NH2, 2, is an organic compound found in urine. Again, each atom has the required number of covalent bonds. In this case, one carbon atom participates in both single and double bonds. Urea and carbon dioxide are molecules with only one carbon atom. But a carbon atom can also use one or more valence electrons to form covalent bonds to other carbon atoms, linking the atoms into chains, as shown here for C3H8. 4.2-9 Full Alternative Text Molecular Diversity Arising from Variation in Carbon Skeletons Carbon chains form the basis of most organic molecules. Carbon skeletons vary in length and may be straight, branched, or arranged in closed rings. Figure 4.5 Some carbon chains have double bonds, which vary in number and location. Such variation in carbon chains is one important source of the molecular complexity and diversity that characterize living matter. In addition, the skeletons of biological molecules often include atoms of other elements, like oxygen and phosphorus, such atoms can also be bonded to carbons of the skeleton. Figure 4.5 Four ways that carbon skeletons can vary. Figure 4.5 Full alternative text. Mastering biology. Animation, diversity of carbon-based molecules. Hydrocarbons. All of the molecules that are shown in. Figures 4.3 and 4.5 are Hydrocarbons, organic molecules consisting of only carbon and hydrogen. Atoms of hydrogen are attached to the carbon skeleton wherever electrons are available for covalent bonding. Hydrocarbons are the major components of petroleum, which is called a fossil fuel because it consists of the partially decomposed remains of organisms that lived millions of years ago. Mastering Biology Interview with Deborah Gordon, studying how ants use hydrocarbons to communicate. Although hydrocarbons are not prevalent in most living organisms, some of a cell's organic molecules have regions consisting of only carbon and hydrogen. For example, the molecules known as fats have long hydrocarbon tails attached to a non-hydrocarbon component. Figure 4.6 Neither petroleum nor fat dissolves in water, both are hydrophobic compounds because the great majority of their bonds are relatively nonpolar carbon to hydrogen linkages. Another characteristic of hydrocarbons is that they can undergo reactions that release a relatively large amount of energy. The gasoline that fuels a car consists of hydrocarbons, and the hydrocarbon tails of fats serve as stored fuel for plant embryos, seeds, and animals. Figure 4.6 The role of hydrocarbons in fats. A. Mammalian adipose cells stockpile fat molecules as a fuel reserve. This colorized micrograph shows part of a human adipose cell with many fat droplets, each containing a large number of fat molecules. B. A fat molecule consists of a small, non hydrocarbon component joined to three hydrocarbon tails that account for the hydrophobic behavior of fats. The tails can be broken down to provide energy. Black equals carbon. Gray equals hydrogen, red equals oxygen. Make connections how do the tails account for the hydrophobic nature of fats? C. Concept 3.2 Isomers Variation in the architecture of organic molecules can be seen in Isomers, compounds that have the same numbers of atoms of the same elements but different structures and hence different properties. We will examine three types of isomers, Structural isomers, cis-trans isomers, and enantiomers. Structural isomers differ in the covalent arrangements of their atoms. Compare, for example, the two 5-carbon compounds in Figure 4.7a. Both have the molecular formula C5H12, but they differ in the covalent arrangement of their carbon skeletons. 
the skeleton is straight in one compound but branched in the other. The number of possible isomers increases tremendously as carbon skeletons increase in size. There are only three forms of C5H12, two of which are shown in figure 4.7a, but there are 18 variants of C8H18 and 366,319 possible structural isomers of C20H42. Structural isomers may also differ in the location of double bonds. Figure 4.73 Types of Isomers Isomers are compounds that have the same molecular formula but different structures. Figure 4.7 Full Alternative Text Draw IT There are three structural isomers of C5H12, draw the one not shown in, A. Mastering Biology Animation, Isomers In Cis-trans isomers, also known as geometric isomers, carbons have covalent bonds to the same atoms, but these atoms differ in their spatial arrangements due to the inflexibility of double bonds. Single bonds allow the atoms they join to rotate freely about the bond axis without changing the compound. In contrast, double bonds do not permit such rotation. If a double bond joins two carbon atoms, and each C also has two different atoms, or groups of atoms, attached to it, then two distinct cis-trans isomers are possible. Consider a simple molecule with two double bonded carbons, each of which has an H and an X attached to it. Figure 4.7b. The arrangement with both XS on the same side of the double bond is called a cis isomer, and that with the XS on opposite sides is called a trans isomer. The subtle difference in shape between such isomers can have a dramatic effect on the biological activities of organic molecules. For example, the biochemistry of vision involves a light induced change of retinal, a chemical compound in the eye, from the cis isomer to the trans isomer, C. Figure 50.17. Another example involves trans fats, harmful fats formed during food processing that are discussed in. Concept 5.3. Enantiomers are isomers that are mirror images of each other and that differ in shape due to the presence of an asymmetric carbon, one that is attached to four different atoms or groups of atoms. See the middle carbon in the ball and stick models shown in. Figure 4.7c. The four groups can be arranged in space around the asymmetric carbon in two different ways that are mirror images. Enantiomers are, in a way, left-handed and right-handed versions of the molecule. Just as your right hand won't fit into a left-handed glove, a right-handed molecule won't fit into the same space as the left-handed version. Usually, only one isomer is biologically active because only that form can bind to specific molecules in an organism. The concept of enantiomers is important in the pharmaceutical industry because the two enantiomers of a drug may not be equally effective, as is the case for both ibuprofen and the asthma medication albuterol. Figure 4.8 Methamphetamine also occurs in two enantiomers that have very different effects. One enantiomer is the highly addictive stimulant drug known as crank, sold illegally in the street drug trade. The other has a much weaker effect and is the active ingredient in an over-the-counter vapor inhaler for treatment of nasal congestion. The differing effects of enantiomers in the body demonstrate that organisms are sensitive to even the subtlest variations in molecular architecture. Once again, we see that molecules have emergent properties that depend on the specific arrangement of their atoms. Figure 4.8 The Pharmacological Importance of Enantiomers Ibuprofen and albuterol are drugs whose enantiomers have different effects. S and R are used here to distinguish between enantiomers, rather than D and L as in. Figure 4.7c Ibuprofen is commonly sold as a mixture of the two enantiomers, the S enantiomer is 100 times more effective than the R form. Albuterol is synthesized and sold only as the R form of that drug, the S form counteracts the active R form. Figure 4.8 Full Alternative Text Concept Check 4.2 Draw it, A, draw a structural formula for C2H4. B, draw the trans isomer of C2H2Cl2. Visual skills which two pairs of molecules in. Figure 4.5 are isomers. For each pair, identify the type of isomer. How are gasoline and fat chemically similar? Visual skills C. 3H8, form isomers. Explain. For suggested answers, C.
concept 4.3 A few chemical groups are key to molecular function. The distinctive properties of an organic molecule depend not only on the arrangement of its mostly carbon skeleton but also on the various chemical groups attached to that skeleton. These groups may participate in chemical reactions or may contribute to function indirectly by their effects on molecular shape, they help give each molecule its unique properties. The chemical groups most important in the processes of life. Consider the differences between estradiol, a type of estrogen, and testosterone. These compounds are female and male sex hormones, respectively, in humans and other vertebrates. Both are steroids, organic molecules with a common carbon skeleton in the form of four fused rings. They differ only in the chemical groups attached to the rings, shown here in abbreviated form, where each corner represents a carbon and its attached hydrogens, the distinctions in molecular architecture are shaded in blue. 4.3 to 11 Full Alternative Text The different actions of these two molecules on many targets throughout the body are the basis of sexual characteristics, producing the contrasting features of male and female vertebrates. In this case, the chemical groups are important because they affect molecular shape, contributing to function. In other cases, chemical groups are directly involved in chemical reactions, such groups are known as functional groups. Each has certain properties, such as shape and charge, that cause it to participate in chemical reactions in a characteristic way. The seven chemical groups most important in biological processes are the hydroxyl, carbonyl, carboxyl, amino, sulfhydryl, phosphate, and methyl groups. The first six groups can be chemically reactive, of these six, all except the sulfhydryl group are also hydrophilic and thus increase the solubility of organic compounds in water. The methyl group is not reactive, but instead often serves as a recognizable tag on biological molecules. Study Figure 4.9 to become familiar with these biologically important chemical groups. As shown at the right of the figure, the carboxyl group and the amino group are ionized at normal cellular pH. Figure 4.9 Some biologically important chemical groups. Figure 4.9 Full alternative text. Mastering biology. Animation, functional groups. ADP, an important source of energy for cellular processes. The phosphate group row in. Figure 4.9 shows a simple example of an organic phosphate molecule. A more complicated organic phosphate. Adenosine triphosphate, or ADP is worth mentioning here because its function in the cell is so important. ADP consists of an organic molecule called adenosine attached to a string of three phosphate groups. 4.3 to 12 full alternative text. Where three phosphates are present in series, as in ADP, one phosphate may be split off as a result of a reaction with water. This inorganic phosphate ion, is often abbreviated in this book, and a phosphate group in an organic molecule is often written as having lost one phosphate, ADP becomes adenosine diphosphate, or ADP. Although ADP is sometimes said to store energy, it is more accurate to think of it as storing the potential to react with water or other molecules. Overall, the process releases energy that can be used by the cell. You'll learn more about this in Concept 8.3 4.3-13 Full Alternative Text The Chemical Elements of Life, A Review Living Matter, as you have learned, consists mainly of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen, with smaller amounts of sulfur and phosphorus. These elements all form strong covalent bonds, an essential characteristic in the architecture of complex organic molecules. Of all these elements, carbon is the virtuoso of the covalent bond. The versatility of carbon makes possible the great diversity of organic molecules, each with particular properties that emerge from the unique arrangement of its mostly carbon skeleton and the chemical groups attached to that skeleton. This variation at the molecular level provides the foundation for the rich biological diversity found on our planet. Concept Check 4.3 Visual skills What does the term amino acid signify about the structure of such a molecule? C. Figure 4.9 What chemical change occurs to ADP when it reacts with water and releases energy? Draw IT Suppose you had an organic molecule such as cysteine, C. Figure 4.9 sulfhydryl group example, and you chemically removed the group and replaced it with. Draw this structure. How would this change the chemical properties of the molecule? Is the central carbon asymmetric before the change? After. Four suggested answers, C. Appendix A.
Summary of Key Concepts Go to Mastering Biology for Assignments, the e-text, the study area, and dynamic study modules. To review key terms, go to the vocabulary self-quiz in the Mastering Biology e-text or study area, or go to goo.gl slash zkjz90. Concept 4.1 Organic Chemistry is Key to the Origin of Life, pp. 57 58 Organic compounds, once thought to arise only within living organisms, were finally synthesized in the laboratory. Living matter is made mostly of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Biological diversity results from carbon's ability to form a huge number of molecules with particular shapes and properties. How did Stanley Miller's experiments support the idea that, even at life's origins, physical and chemical laws govern the processes of life? Concept 4.2 Carbon atoms can form diverse molecules by bonding to four other atoms, pp. 58. 62. Carbon, with a valence of 4, can bond to various other atoms, including O, H, and N. Carbon can also bond to other carbon atoms, forming the carbon skeletons of organic compounds. These skeletons vary in length and shape and have bonding sites for atoms of other elements. Hydrocarbons consist of carbon and hydrogen. Isomers are compounds that have the same molecular formula but different structures and therefore different properties. Three types of isomers are structural isomers, cis-trans isomers, and enantiomers. Visual skills refer back to Figure 4.9 What type of isomers are acetone and propanol? How many asymmetric carbons are present in acetic acid, glycine, and glycerol phosphate? Can these three molecules exist as forms that are enantiomers? Concept 4.3 A few chemical groups are key to molecular function, pp. 62 64 Chemical groups attached to the carbon skeletons of organic molecules participate in chemical reactions, functional groups, or contribute to function by affecting molecular shape, see. Figure 4.9 ADP, adenosine triphosphate, consists of adenosine attached to three phosphate groups. ADP can react with water or other molecules, forming ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and inorganic phosphate. This reaction releases energy that can be used by the cell. 4.2 to 15 Full Alternative Text In what ways does a methyl group differ chemically from the other six important chemical groups shown in? Figure 4.9 Test your understanding. For more multiple choice questions, go to the practice test in the Mastering Biology e-text or study area, or go to goo.gl slash gruwrg. Levels 1 to 2, Remembering slash Understanding. Organic chemistry is currently defined as the study of compounds made only by living cells. The study of carbon compounds. The study of natural as opposed to synthetic, compounds. The study of hydrocarbons. Visual skills which functional group is present in this molecule. 4.3 to 16 full alternative text. Sulfhydryl. Carboxyl. Methyl. Phosphate. Make connections which chemical group is most likely to be responsible for an organic molecule behaving as a base, see. Concept 3.3 Hydroxyl Carbonyl Amino Phosphate Levels 3 to 4, Applying Slash Analyzing Visual skills visualize the structural formula of each of the following hydrocarbons. Which hydrocarbon has a double bond in its carbon skeleton? Visual skills choose the term that correctly describes the relationship between these two sugar molecules. 4.3 to 17 full alternative text. Structural isomers. Cis-trans isomers. Enantiomers. Isotopes. Visual skills identify the asymmetric carbon in this molecule. 4.3 to 18 full alternative text. Which action could produce a carbonyl group? The replacement of the O of a carboxyl group with hydrogen. The addition of a thiol to a hydroxyl. 
the addition of a hydroxyl to a phosphate. The replacement of the nitrogen of an amine with oxygen. Visual skills Which of the molecules shown in question 5 has an asymmetric carbon? Which carbon is asymmetric? Levels 5 to 6, evaluating slash creating. Evolution connection draw it Some scientists think that life elsewhere in the universe might be based on the element silicon, rather than on carbon, as on Earth. Look at the electron distribution diagram for silicon in figure 2.7 and draw the Lewis dot structure for silicon. What properties does silicon share with carbon that would make silicon based life more likely than, say, neon based life or aluminum based life? Scientific inquiry 50 years ago, pregnant women who were prescribed thalidomide for morning sickness gave birth to children with birth defects. Thalidomide is a mixture of two enantiomers, one reduces morning sickness, but the other causes severe birth defects. Today, the FDA has approved this drug for non-pregnant individuals with Hansen's disease, leprosy, or newly diagnosed multiple myeloma, a blood and bone marrow cancer. The beneficial enantiomer can be synthesized and given to patients, but over time, both the beneficial and the harmful enantiomer can be detected in the body. Propose a possible explanation for the presence of the harmful enantiomer. Write about a theme, organization in 1918, an epidemic of sleeping sickness caused an unusual rigid paralysis in some survivors, similar to symptoms of advanced Parkinson's disease. Years later, L-DOPA, below, left, a chemical used to treat Parkinson's disease, was given to some of these patients. L-DOPA was remarkably effective at eliminating the paralysis, at least temporarily. However, its enantiomer, D-DOPA, right, was subsequently shown to have no effect at all, as is the case for Parkinson's disease. In a short essay, 100 to 150 words, Discuss how the effectiveness of one enantiomer and not the other illustrates the theme of structure and function. Synthesize your knowledge. Explain how the chemical structure of the carbon atom accounts for the differences between the male and female lion seen in the photo. For selected answers, see Appendix A.